Ladies and gentlemen online, welcome. We are going live for the fourth Safer Gambling Conference. The National Betting Authority is organizing for the fourth consecutive year the Safer Gambling Week, which is being launched today, October 4th, with this conference. The focus on safer gambling promotes a new understanding of the responsibility of the state and gambling operators and providers to enhance players' protection policies and tools. The conference aims to inform and inspire participants through presentations by distinguished professionals and various stakeholders who will discuss and exchange opinions regarding gambling and safer gambling practices. Now, let me inform you that you can download the agenda from the platform and that there are clickable widgets on the organizer's logo directing you to the relevant websites. You will also have the opportunity to submit your questions anonymously to the speakers throughout the event. You can do so by typing in your question in the Q&A window before clicking submit. Let me also inform you that this year you can use the hashtags hashtag Safer Gambling Conference with a capital S, capital G and capital C and has hashtag SGW2021 and hashtag SGW throughout today's conference. Let me now welcome online Ms. Ioana Fiaku, Chairwoman of the National Betting Authority of Cyprus, for her welcome address. Ms. Fiaku. Θα ήθελα να σα καλωσορίσω στο δεύτερο συνέδριο ασφαλού παιχνιδιού τη Εθνική Αρχή Στοιχημάτων. Το συνέδριο διοργανώνεται για δεύτερη συνεχή χρονιά διαδικτυακά ένεκα τη πανδημία. Ευελπιστώ σύντομα να ξεπεράσουμε την πανδημία και να έχουμε την ευκαιρία να ανταλλάξουμε διαζώσει απόψει και προβληματισμού. Το συνέδριο αποτελεί το έναυσμα των εργασιών και δράσεων τη Εβδομάδα Ασφαλού Παιχνιδιού. Να αναφέρω εντάχει ότι η Εβδομάδα θεσμοθετήθηκε και θα μιλήσουμε ανοιχτά σε ένα ασφαλό, ασφαλές περιβάλλον για τη χαρά παιχνίδια με ακαδημαϊκούς, ειδικού, επαγγελματίε, αλλά και ασφαλές της διπλανής πρόσφασης. Για να βεβαιωθούμε πως παίζουμε με σκοπό τη διασκέδαση, να μιλήσουμε για την πρόληψη, να συζητήσουμε όσα μας προβληματίζουν και να αναγνωρίσουμε τα πρώτα σημάδια ενδεχόμενου προβλήματος. Μέσα από τι δράσει που θα πραγματοποιηθούν κατά τη διάρκεια τη εβδομάδα, η αρχή επιχειρεί να ενημερώσει, να ευαισθητοποιήσει και παράλληλα να εμπλέξει και να κινητοποιήσει το ευρύτερο κοινωνικό σύνολο στην προσπάθεια πρόθεση του ασφαλού παιχνιδιού και προστασία του κοινού από τι συνέπειε τη προβληματική ενασχόληση με τα τυχερά παιχνίδια. Κυρίε και κύριοι, γιατί όμω σήμερα περισσότερο από ποτέ είναι σημαντική η έννοια τη ασφάλεια στο στοίχημα και το τυχερό παιχνίδι, ο κόσμο πέρασε μια πρωτοφανή κρίση με την επέλαση τη πανδημία. Όμω, καθώ οι κοινωνίε ανά το παγκόσμιο προσπαθούν να ανακάμψουν σταδιακά και να προσαρμοστούν στα νέα δεδομένα, έχουμε χρέο ω αρμόδια ρυθμιστική και υποπτική αρχή να εντείνουμε και να ενισχύσουμε τι προσπάθειέ μα για προστασία των παιχτών και του ευρύτερου κοινωνικού συνόλου. Η πανδημία άλλαξε τα δεδομένα και ανέδειξε τη σημασία τη ασφάλεια και υγεία των παιχτών. Κατάφερε επίση να αλλάξει τη στάση και αντίδραση των παρόχων και το επιχειρηματικό του μοντέλο, καθώ διακινδύνευσε η βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη του κλάδου. Ο τομέα των τυχερών παιχνιδιών αναβαθμίστηκε ραγδαία σε παγκόσμιο αλλά και σε εθνικό επίπεδο τα τελευταία χρόνια. Ενδεικτικά, να αναφέρω ότι σε εθνικό επίπεδο το ποσοστό των εσόδων από τη στοιχηματική δραστηριότητα το 2016 ανήλθε στο 0,99% του ΑΕΠ. Το 2019 κατέγραψε ουσιαστική αύξηση σημειώνοντα ποσοστό 3,44% του ΑΕΠ. Και το 2020, παρά τη συρρήκνωση του ΑΕΠ ενέκα τη πανδημία οικονομική κρίση κατά 6,5%. Το ποσοστό των εσόδων στοιχήματο ω προ το ΑΕΠ ανήλθε στο 2,98%. Είναι σημαντικό να αναφέρουμε ότι τα ποσοστά αναδεικνύουν την αποτελεσματικότητα τη ρύθμιση. Η αρχή οφείλει να είναι θεματοφύλακα τη ορθή λειτουργία τη αγορά. Αποστολή τη ήταν και παραμένει η αποτελεσματική ρύθμιση τη αγορά, η διασφάλιση τη βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη, η δημιουργία μηχανισμών για την ελαχιστοποίηση των κινδύνων που ελοχεύει η παράνομη αγορά, ο καθορισμό των κατάλληλων προποθέσεων για την έγκαιρη υιοθέτηση των συνεχών εξελίξεων. Με γνώμονα πάντα τη δημιουργία ενό ασφαλού περιβάλλοντο για το ευρύτερο κοινό. Όταν πρώτο ξεκινήσαμε το 2017 να εκφωνήσουμε το σχέδιο δράση τη αρχή για τον υπεύθυνο στοιχηματισμό, υπήρξε σοβαρό προβληματισμό κατά πόσο τα εμπλεκόμενα μέρη θα αποδέχονταν και θα συνεργάζονταν για την εφαρμογή του. Η ενασχόληση με το στοίχημα αποτελούσε ταμπού για την κυπριακή κοινωνία, όσο μάλλον όταν κάποιο παίχτη παρουσιάζει προβληματική συμπεριφορά. Σήμερα. Είμαστε σε θέση να πούμε ότι μέσα από την υλοποίηση του σχεδίου δράση μα, τι συνεχεί προσπάθειε, την αποτελεσματική αντιμετώπιση των προκλήσεων, αλλά και τι κατάλληλε συνέργειε, έχει αποστηματιστεί σε μεγάλο βαθμό η προβληματική συμπεριφορά. 
πλέον οι παίχτε μπορούν πιο εύκολα να μοιραστούν του προβληματισμού του και να ζητήσουν βοήθεια εκεί όπου χρειάζεται, χωρί το φόβο για στιγματισμό από την κοινωνία. Εξίσου, έχει καταγραφεί σημαντική πρόοδο και στο πώ αντιμετωπίζουν οι εταιρείε την ασφάλεια των παιχτών, ιδιαίτερα κατά την περίοδο τη πανδημία, όπου επέδειξαν ήθο, επαγγελματισμό και υπευθυνότητα. Ενδεικτικό παράδειγμα αποτελεί αύξηση τη χρήση εργαλείων αυτοπροστασία από του παίχτε, δεδομένη βεβαίω και τη προώθηση που έτυχαν από του παρόχου. Η ρυθμίση και η εποχή των τυχερών παιχνιδιών αντιμετώπιζε πάντα προκλήσει. Η αρχή αφουγκραζόμενη τι σύγχρονε προκλήσει τόσο για την αποτελεσματική ρύθμιση τη αγορά, όσο και τη διασφάλιση τη προστασία των παιχτών, εφάρμοσε και θα εφαρμόσει κατάλληλα μέτρα, παρεμβάσει και κανονισμού. Επιτρέψτε μου να αναφερθώ στα σημαντικότερα, τα οποία υλοποιήθηκαν και θα υλοποιηθούν το επόμενο χρονικό διάστημα. Σημαντική ασπίδα προστασία των παιχτών, των νέων ατόμων και των ευάλωτων ομάδων του πληθυσμού αποτελεί ο αναθεωρημένο κώδικα διαφήμιση. Μέσα από τον κώδικα, οι πάροχοι στοιχηματικών υπηρεσιών υποχρεούνται να εφαρμόζουν ένα καθολικό πλαίσιο αποδεκτών πρακτικών διαφήμιση, διασφαλίζοντα έτσι το δημόσιο συμφέρον, ενισχύοντα τα δικαιώματα των παιχτών και ελαχιστοποιώντα την έκθεση ανηλίκων σε στοιχηματικέ διαφημίσει και προθετικέ ενέργειε. Η χρήση προτύπων ενισχύει την οριζόντια εναρμόνιση με το ρυθμιστικό πλαίσιο. Σημαντικό κανονιστικό πλαίσιο που θα τεθεί σε εφαρμογή το επόμενο χρονικό διάστημα είναι το πρότυπο ασφαλού παιχνιδιού, όπου θα περιλαμβάνει τι διατάξει για την ενίσχυση τη κοινωνική ευθύνη των εταιριών με δομημένο και τεκμηριωμένο τρόπο. Οι πάροχοι με την εφαρμογή του προτύπου θα καλεστούν να πιστοποιηθούν με τα υψηλότερα κριτήρια για την ασφάλεια των παιχτών αλλά και τη βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη του τομέα. Εκτό από την υποχρέωση των παρόχων για εφαρμογή μέτρων και κανονισμών, η αρχή είναι στη διαδικασία ανάπτυξη τη πλατφόρμα καθολικού αυτοαποκλεισμού. Οι παίχτε θα έχουν στη διάθεσή του ένα σημαντικό εργαλείο για έλεγχο τη στοιχηματική του συμπεριφορά. Θα μπορούν να αυτοεξαιρεθούν από τη στοιχηματική δραστηριότητα είτε για καθορισμένο χρονικό διάστημα, είτε παόριστον από όλου του παρόχου, μέσα από μια εύχρηστη πλατφόρμα, χωρί πολύπλοκε διαδικασίε. Από την άλλη. Οι πάροχοι θα έχουν την υποχρέωση να εφαρμόσουν άμεσα το αίτημα του παίχτη για αυτοαποκλεισμό από τη στοιχηματική δραστηριότητα. Σκοπό είναι σε βάθο χρόνου η ένταξη των παρόχων επίγεια παροχή υπηρεσιών τυχερών παιχνιδιών στην πλατφόρμα. Η ενίσχυση τη έρευνα θα συνεχίσει να είναι ένα άλλο βασικό στρατηγικό στρατηγικός πυλώνα τη αρχή. Το επόμενο χρονικό διάστημα ολοκληρώνεται η πρώτη εθνική ακαδημαϊκή έρευνα, όπου θα, όπου θα μας δώσει τα πρώτα ουσιαστικά αποτελέσματα. Μέσα από τη συνεχή ε, καταγραφή δεδομένων, θα είμαστε σε θέση να αξιολογούμε περισσότερο και πιο ε, σύντομα τα, ε, τα δεδομένα τα οποία θα έχουμε για σκοπούς πρόληψης και αποτροπή των όποιων κινδύνων. Θα ήθελα να σταθώ σε κάτι που είπε ο Γεράντ Τορτάλη στην έρευνα του για την ιστορία των τυχερών παιχνιδιών στο Ίδρυμα Μελετών και Ερευνών Πενέτο τη Ιταλία. Όπω ανάφερε, το πρόβλημα δεν είναι καθόλου σύγχρονο, με δεδομένο ότι ο αυτοκράτορα Αυγούστο έχανε μερικέ φορέ μέχρι και 20.000 συστέρτιου σε μια μέρα. Και πρόσθεσε ότι δεν υπάρχει αφιβολία για τι σοβαρέ συνέπειε των τυχερών παιχνιδιών σε προσωπικό και κοινωνικό επίπεδο όταν δεν ελέγχονται σωστά. Τα τυχερά παιχνίδια είναι ένα σύνθετο φαινόμενο εξαιρετική σημασία για την κοινωνία μα. Ένα φαινόμενο που είναι απείρω πιο πολύπλοκο από το να μπαίνουν στοιχήματα για την έκβαση των δημαρχιακών εκλογών ή την εκλογή του Πάπα. Συνεπώ, η προβληματική ενασχόληση με τα τυχερά παιχνίδια δεν είναι καθόλου σύγχρονο πρόβλημα, αλλά ένα πρόβλημα που απαιτεί σύγχρονε λύσει. Η ανασκόπηση των τελευταίων επιστημονικών εξελίξεων και η παγκόσμια τάση που επικρατεί μα οδήγησε στην αναθεώρηση τη στρατηγική τη αρχή 2022-2025 για το ασφαλέ παιχνίδι, υιοθετώντα σύγχρονε λύσει. Στρατηγική που επικεντρώνεται σε τέσσερι βασικού άξονε. Πρώτον, θωρακίζοντα του παίχτε και παρέχοντα εκείνα τα εργαλεία που θα του δώσουν την ευκαιρία να λάβουν ενημερωμένε αποφάσει. Αυτό επιτυχάνεται μέσα από τη βελτίωση του ρυθμιστικού και κανονιστικού πλαισίου, το σωστό εποπτικό ρόλο και την καταπολέμηση τη παράνομη αγορά. Δεύτερον, διασφαλίζοντα την ευημερία του οικογενειακού και φιλικού περιβάλλοντο των παιχτών. Καθώ και του κοινωνικού συνόλου. Με αυτό το δεδομένο, δίνεται να μειωθεί το κόστο των αρνητικών συνεπειών τη προβληματική ενασχόληση με τα τυχερά παιχνίδια στην κοινωνία και στη δημόσια υγεία. Τρίτον, παροτρύνοντα και καθοδηγώντα του παρόχου να θέσουν στο επίκεντρο τη ατζέντα του τη βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη τη αγορά και την προστασία τη υγεία των παιχτών. Και τέταρτον, ενισχύοντα τι συνέργειε μεταξύ των εμπλεκόμενων μερών σε εθνικό, ευρωπαϊκό αλλά και διεθνέ επίπεδο. Η παθολογική ενασχόληση με τα τυχερά παιχνίδια είναι ένα πολυεπίπεδο και σύνθερο πρόβλημα, αφού επεκτείνεται σε διάφορε κοινωνικέ και οικονομικέ ψυχέ. 
Άρα, αν αποτύχουμε να συνεργαστούμε, τότε θα αποτύχουμε από την υποχρέωση μα για προστασία τη κοινωνία. Κυρίε και κύριοι, ακρογωνιέ λήθο τη αρχή είναι να συνεχίσει να κατέχει ηγετικό ρόλο στην ανάπτυξη του τομέα για την οικοδόμηση συνθηκών μακροχρόνια, οικονομική ευημερία και βιωσιμότητα. Έχοντα πάντοτε στην κορυφή των προτεραιοτήτων τη την προστασία του κοινωνικού συνόλου, την εξάλληψη τη παρανομία στον τομέα, αλλά και την παρεμπόδιση και καταπολέμηση τη νομιμοποίηση εσόδων από παράνομε δραστηριότητε χωρί οποιασδήποτε εκπτώσει. Η Εθνική Αρχή Στοιχημάτων διαβεβαιώνει ότι θα συνεχίσει να αναλαμβάνει πρωτοβουλίε και να δράμε γνώμονα την υλοποίηση των στρατηγικών τη στόχων για την επιτυχή δημιουργία ενό ασφαλού περιβάλλοντο και την αντιμετώπιση των οποιοδήποτε προκλήσεων. Ευχαριστώ για τη συμμετοχή σα στο συνέδριο. Και εύχομαι να έχουμε ένα επικοδομητικό συνέδριο και ένα επικοδομητικό διάλογο. Καλή συνέχεια. Ευχαριστώ. Thank you, Ms. Φιάκου. Let us now move on to the Minister of Finance, Mr. Κωνσταντίνος Πετρίδης, for his welcome address. Αγαπητοί φίλοι, συμμετέχοντε στο συνέδριο, είναι όντω με ιδιαίτερη τιμή που ευθύνω αυτό το χαιρετισμό σήμερα στο τέταρτο συνέδριο ασφαλού παιγνίου. Ε, σημαντικό συνέδριο που φιλοδοξεί να αναδείξει τις σημαντικές πτυχές της ασφαλούς ενασχόλησης με το στοίχημα και τα τυχερά παιχνίδια. Ε, ο τομέας της στοιχηματικής δραστηριότητας όντως είναι ένας τομέας ο οποίος γνώρισε αξιοσημείωτη ανάπτυξη τα τελευταία χρόνια. Και σε αυτή την ανάπτυξη ήταν απόλυτα καθοριστική η συμβολή του βασικού εταίρου ε, της κυβέρνηση των τομέα της στοιχηματικής δραστηριότητας, της Εθνικής Αρχής Στοιχημάτων. Και δεν είναι υπερβολή να πούμε ότι η συγκεκριμένος τομέας έχει εξελιχθεί όντως σε ένα από τους πυλώνες ανάπτυξης της κυπριακής οικονομίας. Και η Πρόεδρος έχει αναφέρει κάποια ενδεικτικά νούμερα, όπως το ποσοστό των εσέδων από την στοιχηματική δραστηριότητα αυξήθηκε από 0,99% του ΑΕΠ το 2016 στο 3,44% το 2019 και το 2020 παρά την σημαντική πτώση ε, του ΑΕΠ ε, λόγω της, της υγειονομικής κρίσης και του COVID ε, το ποσοστό των εισόδων ε, παρέμεινε σε σχετικά ψηλά επίπεδα στο 2,98% του ΑΕΠ ως ένας τομέας της οικονομίας, ο οποίος όλοι μας παραδεχόμαστε εξού και για το συνέδριο ότι έχει αρκετές ιδιαιτερότητες, έχει αρκετές ευαισθησίες με ενδεχόμενες κοινωνικές προεκτάσεις, είναι απόλυτα αναγκαία η ρυθμιζόμενη και η υπεύθυνη ανάπτυξη και λειτουργία των παιγνίων και της στοιχηματικής δραστηριότητας. Και αυτή είναι και η στρατηγική επιδίωξη η στρατηγική πολιτική της κυβέρνησης, η οποία προσβλέπει και ενθαρρύνει την περαιτέρω ανάπτυξη του τομέα, χωρίς όμως να θέτει υπό διαπραγμάτευση την πάγια θέση της ότι η προστασία της κοινωνίας και διασφάλιση της δημόσιας υγείας είναι εκ των ονουκάνευ. Και είμαι σίγουρος και το βλέπουμε αυτό ότι η Εθνική Αρχή Στοιχημάτων επιτελεί επάξια αυτό το ρόλο. Και είναι αξιοσημειώτη η πρόοδος η οποία έχει επέλθει στον κλάδο του στοιχήματο και των τυχερών παιχνιδιών τα τελευταία, την τελευταία πενταετία. Και δεν είναι τυχαία και δεν είναι άσχετη με τον πολύ σημαντικό ρόλο που επιτελεί η Εθνική Αρχή Στοιχημάτων. Είναι όντω έντονη η πεποίθησή μας ότι το ζητούμενο δεν είναι οι καθολικές απαγορεύσεις. Και αυτό είναι και έντονη προσωπική μου άποψη, διότι οι καθολικές απαγορεύσεις αυτό το οποίο οδηγούν στην πραγματικότητα είναι να ανοίξουν παράθυρα στην παρανομία. Και παράθυρα στην παρανομία στον τομέα του παιγνίου θα έχει δυσανάλογες και σοβαρότατες και μεγάλες κοινωνικές προεκτάσεις. Άρα η προτεραιότητα μας είναι η αποτελεσματική ρύθμιση της αγοράς και η λειτουργία της σε πλαίσια της νομιμότητας, ούτως ώστε να δημιουργείται αξία για την κυπριακή οικονομία και η χάραξη αποτελεσματικής πολιτικής για την πρόληψη της προβληματικής ενασχόλησης με το στοίχημα και τα τεχερά παιχνίδια γενικότερα. Ε, ταυτόχρονα χαιρόμαστε που η αρχή ε, συνεχίζει να ενισχύει την, τεχνογλω... την τεχνογνωσία της, να ενισχύει τις μεθόδους της, έτσι ώστε να εξυπηρετεί με τον καλύτερο δυνατό τρόπο τον πρωταρχικό της ρόλο ως 
ο επόπτη τη στοιχηματική δραστηριότητα και, και, και των ορισμένων τυχερών παιχνιδιών σε μετέπειτα στάδιο. Αυτό δυνατόν να επιτευχθεί μόνο με τι συνεχεί προσπαθίε για υποπτική αριστεία και χωρί καμία ανοχή σε παράνομε δραστηριότητε. Οι πολιτικέ θα πρέπει να επιδιώκουν τη δημιουργία μια ορθά δομημένη αγορά με ισχυρά δικαιούμενε οντότητε, δημιουργώντα ένα ασφαλέ και βιώσιμο περιβάλλον τόσο για του εποπτευόμενου παρόχου, όσο και για του παίχτε. Θεωρώ επίση ότι η εποπτεία του στοιχήματο και των τυχερών παιχνιδιών θα ενισχυθεί περαιτέρω το επόμενο χρονικό διάστημα με τη χρήση τη τεχνολογία blockchain, καθώ και με την υλοποίηση τη ψηφιακή πολιτική τη αρχή. Και ξανά δράτοντα την ευκαιρία, θα ήθελα να συγχαρώ την αρχή για την στοχοπροσήλωση τη στην υλοποίηση των στρατηγικών επιδιώξεων τη κυβέρνηση. Και από πλευρά μα, από πλευρά τη κυβέρνηση, θα διαβεβαιώ, διαβεβαιώνουμε ότι η κυβέρνηση, το Υπουργείο Οικονομικών, θα, 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 θα σταθεί αρρωγό σε όλε τι προσπάθειε τη αρχή για περαιτέρω εξυγχρονισμό και αποτελεσματικότητη ρύθμιση του ε, τομέα των τυχερών παιχνιδιών. Ε, σίγουρα. Βρισκόμαστε στην α, πανδημία. Ε, οδεύουμε προς το τέλος της οικονομικής κρίσης, κρίσης η οποία δημιούργησε α, η οικονομία, η, η πανδημία του COVID-19. Το 2020 ήταν σίγουρα μια πολύ δύσκολη χρονιά. Ήταν μια χρονιά που είδαμε συρρήκνωση της κυπριακής οικονομίας, αλλά βλέπουμε αυτή τη στιγμή όχι την ανάκαμψη, Έχουμε περάσει από το στάδιο τη ανάκαμψη και προχωρούμε στο στάδιο τη ανάπτυξη. Έχουμε δει του τελευταίε δείχτε τη ανεργία, που η ανεργία στην Κύπρο σημείωσε τον Αύγουστο μείωση στο 4,4% σε σχέση με 8,6% τον περασμένο χρόνο, που ήταν η μεγαλύτερη α, μείωση τη ανεργία που έγινε σε, ε, σε ευρωπαϊκό επίπεδο. Βλέπουμε τι εκτιμήσει για τον ρυθμό ανάπτυξη να υπερβαίνουν αυτή τη στιγμή το 5,5% για το 2020. 21, και με μια μεγάλη προοπτική για το 2022, ειδικά αν χρησιμοποιήσουμε τα όπλα τα οποία μας παρέχει το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης. Και όταν λέω το Ταμείο Ανάκαμψης, δεν εννοώ μόνο τα κονδύλια τα οποία θα εισέλθουν στην οικονομία για τη λειτουργία, για την χρηματοδότηση των υποδομών, είτε για ορισμένα προγράμματα, αλλά εννοώ και τις μεταρρυθμίσεις. Τις μεταρρυθμίσεις οι οποίες είναι αυτές οι οποίε θα φέρουν την πραγματική βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη. Ε, και, ο κάδο, και ο κάθε κλάδο πρέπει να βλέπει αποτελεσματικά την δική του τη βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη. Και χαίρομαι πάρα πολύ που όσον αφορά τον τομέα του, του παιγνίου, οι προσπάθειε τη αρχή σε αυτό αποσκοπούν. Στο να προλαμβάνει ε, καταστάσει, στο να προλαμβάνει ένα ραγδαίο ανεπτυσσόμενο κλάδο και τεχνολογικά αλλά και. και, και και κοινωνικά, ούτω ώστε να είναι πάντα η ρύθμιση ένα βήμα μπροστά από τι ίδιε εξελίξει. Και αυτό σημαίνει βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη. Αυτή τη βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη θέλουμε να τη φέρουμε, να τη φέρουμε και με μεταρρυθμίσει σε, σε όλο το εύρο τη οικονομία. Μεταρρυθμίσει στην τοπική αυτοδιοίκηση, στη δικαιοσύνη, στη δημόσια υπηρεσία. Και ω Κύπροι πρέπει να μάθουμε ότι αυτή είναι η βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη. Η βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη έρχεται μέσω των μεταρρυθμίσεων και όχι μόνο ε, μέσω των κονδυλίων. Και αυτή είναι η πεποίθηση μας και εγώ χαίρομαι που η, αρχή, η Εθνική Αρχή Παιγνίου το έχει στοιχημάτων, το έχει συνειδητοποιήσει και προσπαθεί θεσμικά να είναι πάντα ένα βήμα μπροστά για την βιώσιμη ανάπτυξη του κλάδου. Ξανά θα ήθελα να συγχαρώ την Εθνική Αρχή η ανάδεξη της Κύπρου ελκυστικού προορισμού για επενδύσεις σε όλους τους τομείς της Κυπριακής Οικονομίας είναι η κορυφαία μας προτεραιότητα ως κυβέρνηση. Η δημιουργία των κατάλληλων συνθήκων για την οικοδόμηση μακαροχρόνιας ευημερίας των τόπων μας είναι προτεραιότητά μας και μέσω των κοντιλίων, αλλά όπως είπα και μέσω των μεταρρυθμίσεων. Ξανά θα ήθελα να συγχαρώ θερμά την, την, την Εθνική Αρχή Στοιχημάτων για τη διοργάνωση του συνεδρίου, ενός πολύ σημαντικού συνεδρίου, που δημιουργεί σημαντική αξία στην εγκαθίδρυση του ασφαλούς παιγνίου με σκοπό την πρόληψη της προβληματικής ανασχολήσης με τα τυχερά παιχνίδια. Σας ευχαριστώ και είμαι βέβαιος ότι θα ακολουθήσει ένα χρήσιμο και παραγωγικό συνέδριο. Καλές επιτυχίες. Ευχαριστούμε πάρα πολύ κύριε Υπουργέ. Thank you very much, Mr. Petridis. Dr. Heather Wardle from so School of Social and Political Sciences of the University of Glasgow in the UK will address the topic of gambling as a public health issue. Gambling harms. So, do we need global solutions 
to global problems, gambling is increasingly a global public health issue, dominated by global corporations working across dif different jurisdictions. The continued development of online gambling with trends accelerated by COVID-19 means that solutions aiming to protect the public from these problematic issues need to have a global perspective. This presentation will discuss the work of the Lancet Public Health Commission on Gambling, which seeks to develop these recommendations, discuss why this is needed and how people can get involved. Hi, everybody. Um, and firstly, thank you to the National Betting Authority in Cyprus for inviting me to speak here today and to join you at this fourth Safer uh, Gambling Conference that I know is happening during Safer Gambling Week in Cyprus. I'm exceptionally sorry that I am not there in person, um, as I'm sure many of us are, um, but equally sorry that I'm having to do this as a pre-record, um, as I had other, other engagements um, today. Um, and in fact, as we speak, I should be attending a political party conference um, in England to talk to the incumbent government about the needs of gambling reform in Britain. And if anyone follows British politics, you can probably imagine what kind of reception I might get there um, and how challenging that situation might be. So all I can say is wish, wish me well in that endeavour. But today, what I've been asked to talk about is a piece of work that we are conducting, myself and many colleagues, some of whom you'll actually hear from later today, for the Lancet Public Health, which has asked us to run what they call a commission on gambling. Now, essentially, what they are interested in is understanding the evidence base around um, gambling-related harms, understanding what the issues are, what the issues might be going forward, and what solutions might need to be generated to better protect people from the harms associated with gambling. And this is very much taking a global perspective on gambling harms and trying to understand where we as individual researchers in our individual nations can actually come together and try to see what a set of solutions might be for what is it a very an increasingly global um, and fast-paced corporate um, environment and product that, uh, that we're witnessing. So just to say a little bit about me, I'm Heather Wardle. I'm based at the University of Glasgow, um, and I will just go over some disclosures. So just to say, uh, the Lancet Public Health Commission on Gambling is chaired by three people, of which I am one, uh, but also Louisa de Genhart and Shakar Saxena. Uh, Louisa is an expert in substance abuse and misuse and is bringing that related knowledge to this area. Shakar is a former head of the Addictive Behaviours and Substance Abuse Division at the WHO and so has real experience on how you translate um, recommendations into real world policy action. We also have a range of colleagues that we are working with who are listed here. Some names may be familiar. Um, Rachel Wahlberg, for example, I know is uh, speaking with you later today, and some less so. Um, and we've really tried to get input from people across the globe. So we have people who are based in Brazil, in China, in Malawi, in Ghana, in India, um, all contributing to this, uh, this piece of work. And just a few disclosures about myself, just to say that I have um, previously performed a role being uh, an independent advisor to the UK government on gambling policy. And previously in the last three years, I've worked on a project uh, looking at the relationship between gambling and suicide for Gamble Aware. So what is this piece of work all about? Well, there is growing awareness that gambling harms are severe, um, that gambling is expanding across different jurisdictions, that different nations are opening up to the idea of commercial gambling where they hadn't before. Um, and this creates a whole range of challenges that we need to consider. And what we're trying to do is to think about what kind of recommendations for action should we be implementing to ensure that gambling is provided and regulated in the public interest. 
Now, we define the public interest as protecting the public from harm. And the reason that we think this work is really important is that recognition that gambling is not an ordinary commodity. It is for some health harming and those health harms are severe. As you've said before, we've looked at, you know, there is a relationship, for example, between um, problematic gambling behaviours and suicidality. So these are not trivial, insignificant harms. And we also know that the harms are much more wide ranging than we have previously acknowledged. So citing work that Rachel has done here, you know, previously global rates of problematic gambling were estimated to be about 2.3%. 2 but actually that belies a whole sector of other people who experience perhaps lower level harms or people who are affected by the gambling of others. So, for example, there is there are estimates that for every problematic for every person who is a pro experiences problematic gambling, they actually impact upon at least six other people. So there is a multiplier effect here. But also when you look at certainly in Great Britain, when you look at engagement in particular types of products, you can see that there are rates of possibly up to around one in four people who engage with that product who are experiencing some kind of difficulty or harm, harmful consequence, negative consequence from their gambling behavior. Now, again, that all reinforces that this isn't an ordinary commodity. I'm unsure of what the situation is in Cyprus, but certainly in Great Britain in the past 20 years, there has been a big push to try and view gambling as this leisure activity that's similar to other kind of recreation, going to the cinema, uh, going to music festivals and so on. It's not the same kind of thing. It has a whole different risk profile to those kind of, kind of activities. And we really need to acknowledge that and then think about what, what range of solutions, what range of um, regulations are appropriate to activities with that kind of risk profile. Other things that we, was, uh, we know, certainly from a global perspective, is that gambling has the potential to exacerbate inequalities. So if we were to look at um, gambling behaviours by uh, deprivation, for example, I mean, we see commonly, and it's not just in Great Britain, we see this across the board, that people who live in more deprived areas have quite similar participation um, rates to other people. But those who do participate have highly elevated rates of problematic gambling. And there is a whole question about the extent to which um, gambling is extracted for those communities or can be extracted for those communities and you know, exacerbates existing um, social inequalities. And the fourth and perhaps the most important aspect, I think, of our work is that we have to absolutely recognise that de the determinants of people's behaviours are shaped by increasingly powerful um, corporations and also increase uh, and are shaped also by the political power um, in terms of what legislation is provided. And I think we have tended in the past to focus much more on the individual and what actions an individual can take and what actions people might be able to encourage individuals to take to be able to um, limit their exposure to risk. But that's not the only source of their exposure. They are exposed to risk by the actions of companies, by the actions of politicians, who set the framework for how we provide and promote different forms of gambling. So you may be wondering, why are we interested in this right now? Um, I mean, there has been much more increased recognition of the public health harms that are associated with gambling. I mean, certainly when I start, started to work in this field around 10 years ago uh, or more, um, if you talked about gambling as being a health issue, you, you were virtually laughed out of the building. Um, 
and there has increasingly, again, in Great Britain, and I think probably elsewhere, a greater recognition of the health harms associated with gambling, and that actually it could benefit from taking that kind of public health lens in terms of thinking about the range of different protections that are, that are available. And part of this has become uh, associated with an increasing evidence base. So we, we have greater insight now into how gambling um, harms manifest and the kind of magnitude of them. Um, and that some, some evidence suggests that they are far greater than we've previously um, acknowledged, um, perhaps, perhaps on a similar scale to alcohol uh, misuse or dependence. We also see gambling inevitably, and as it ever has been, being used as a reaction to challenging times. And that's certainly been accelerated, I think, during the COVID-19 pandemic. So you have rapidly liberalizing policies in many jurisdictions. We just need to look at in North America to see what's happening there. Um, you have gambling starting and gambling companies now being actually really heavily embedded in countries where there is no regulatory infrastructure. Um, and once that foothold has been taken, it's very un difficult to undo that. And we also are seeing countries talk about um, gambling as a way to fill deficits left by the COVID crisis. And um, certainly that is being mentioned in debates in California, um, in Japan and so on. So you've got this a kind of acceleration, I think, that has happened uh, as part of the COVID pandemic. The third thing is absolutely, you know, technological change has absolutely changed the kind of pace and connection that we have between users, commercial entities, and it also creates new products. So again, 25, 30 years ago, could we have envisaged the in-play betting market um, being as important as it is now? We also see gambling incur into other areas of life, for example, gaming, where there is a lot of debate about whether gambling is um, being freely provided to children or not through those forums. But it's really that relationship that Cons corporations now have with gambling consumers and how they use that relationship. So if you were to think about the tobacco industry 30, 40 years ago, you could imagine what they might have done had they had the same level of information and insight on the people who smoked their products as the gambling companies do about the people who use their products. And there's a, a real need to really critically analyze some of those relationships and what the impact of that is. And as I said, you know, gambling is an accelerant of inequalities. Uh, and you can see, you know, we, we perhaps call it regulatory escape, you know, to coin the phrase of my colleague Gerda Reith. Um, you know, as regulation potentially tightens in one area, corporations look for new markets to fulfill their growth mandate because that's their imperative to, uh, particularly when when certain corporations have shareholders um, and are looking to countries well i say are looking they are there they are there in country in different african countries for example looking to latin america as the uh, the sleeping giant of the gambling market So what are the kinds of things that we are looking at in this commission? So as well as reviewing the evidence base on harms, um, and particularly what comes out of longitudinal data and so that we can see a bit more about those kind of those drivers and predictors and how people's behaviors change over time. We also have a broader framing, which is trying to understand the key issues at play here. So we start from the premise, or certainly I start from the premise, that I do think the level um, of harms have been underestimated, not just in terms of the types of harms and their legacy that effect that has on people, but also the impact that it has on what we might call affected others in terms of thinking about how many people are affected by gambling-related harms. 
we are you know, we're in this context where there's with, within that underestimation of harms there has then been this dominant theory of well is you know, gambling's an ordinary leisure activity everyone should be doing it let's not let's not uh, punish the many for for the the tiny minority or the few as i've heard it called and that is a sense of itself certainly in great britain is you know, coupled with this this growth imperative that the industry must grow the industry must innovate the industry must be um, sustainable in a way that it means more people gambling more often generating more money and then underpinning all of that is there has been political support for these ideas these these ideas have been broadly well supported in some nations not in all um absolutely not we've got some some examples notable examples of the of the tide turning and, and political will shifting but there's definitely a complicity and all of these things in some nations have created a range of outcomes which has been to encourage the global expansion of gambling um, and particular business practices particularly what we might see as quite aggressive marketing to both retain and um, attract new customers we also see supercharging of products so even some products that we think might you know, we perhaps typically think are quite benign um, for example lotteries if you look at how lotteries are being enacted in somewhere like malawi they have six seven lottery draws a day and encourage people to sign up for every single one um, now that is very different from the uk perspective of lotteries where we tend to think of lotteries as being you know the, one of the least risky forms of gambling when it's got that repetition and it's so frequent um, that puts a different complexion on the type of products you might think a lottery is in addition, and this relates to the kind of business practices, you know, who's supercharging the processes. So, you know, the use of machine learning, both for positive and for potentially negative um, outcomes, um, particularly the marketing practices, as I've said, cross-selling of products, um, optimization of um, customers, you know, really knowing your customer and being able to, you know, reach reach for them and get and get them back into your your business you know there's definitely been you know some really quite high profile instances of poor practice um on the parts of corporations in relating to that and finally i think one of the outcomes that relates to some of this is that there have been you know, inadequate regulatory responses and inadequate regulatory models if you think that this is something that is not especially harmful only it only harms a very few people the kind of regulation you then um model you then have is a one that bears very much more towards kind of a self-regulatory approach whereas if you believe the harms are perhaps broader than that you would tend to have a regulatory approach that is perhaps more precautionary it is perhaps more principles based and more rules and regulated based so these drivers and understanding them and categorizing them and thinking about how they frame the issue have real consequences for the kind of outcome and the kind of environments we operate in. And I'm sure it comes as uh, no surprise to anybody in this room that you know, we are absolutely talking about a global turn when it comes to gambling corporations so this is just a visual representation of where Entain, who used to be gbc one of the biggest gambling companies um, in the world uh, and the different brand names they have the different presences they have um, in north america in south america in south africa china australia and in europe um, and you can see it really is a global company So these are the kind of things that we'll be thinking about as part of our commission work. Um, now, of course, we are aware that this is a, a global commission and we want to reflect the range and diversity of practices in different nations. 
Um, and some of those drivers and outcomes that I've just mentioned may not be applicable to the jurisdictions uh, in which you come from, because you might have different economic models or your governments have taken different approaches. What we really need is to be able to reflect some of that diversity in our thinking. So this is really an appeal for anybody who is part of this session to come forward and get in touch with us and provide us any insights, any thoughts, any data from your jurisdiction that we can build into our work and our process. We're also really interested in you know, examples about kind of what works actually. If you were sitting down to think, well, these are the kind of recommendations that I would make to say if you're going to regulate or um, provide gambling in the public interest uh, and protect people from harms, these are the kind of things that are known to work. Um, what kind of things might work? And, and also critically, you know, how might we influence people to take on board some of these ideas? Something else that we're actively working on is trying to get more WHO involvement in this, and they are involved in this and supportive of this. But I mean, it could be something really simple, like trying to monitor gambling behaviours more globally by adding to um, information to some of their standardised surveillance surveys, so that we can just get better insight about the global nature of this. Could they issue briefing notes or perhaps some formal guidelines? Ultimately, as well, we want this to be a catalyst. You know, this. I, I see the Atlantic Public Health Commission on Gambling as the starting point, actually. We want to be able to generate networks and critical friends um, and develop a kind of stakeholder map to discuss our ideas and our recommendations and, and how we might be able to take those, those forward. Um, so again, if anyone is remotely interested in this, please, um, please do get in touch. And equally, if and when we come to the point of we actually have a commission to present and some ideas and some recommendations, we'd be really keen to speak to people about holding localised launch events so that we can disseminate and have a conversation around our ideas going forward. So I hope you have an absolutely brilliant uh, rest of your day at the conference. I can see that you're in very safe hands with some of the speakers who are who are presenting later on. Um, I am again, I am exceptionally sorry that I can't be there um, to stream this live in person. But please, please do get in touch with me if you have any comments, queries, thoughts based on anything that I've said today. And this is my email address and also the email address of my co-chairs on the Atlantic Public Health um, Commission on Gambling Work as well. Thank you very much. We would like to thank Dr. Wardle for taking the time to pre-record uh, this uh, video presentation that we just watched. Uh, let me now welcome Dr. Jörg Hoffmann, senior partner at Melcher's Law Firm and lecturer at the University of Heidelberg for Gambling Law in Germany, who will be moderating our first panel discussion on safer gambling, the regulator's view. Let me remind you that you can submit your questions anonymously to the speakers throughout the event. You can do so by typing in your question in the Q&A window before clicking submit. Dr. Hoffman, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much and welcome or good morning to everybody. It's a pleasure to moderate this first panel discussion today. Now that the industry is committed to player protection, that regulators set and supervise the standards for responsible gaming. As technology, both in terms of offerings and player protection is constantly advancing, this is a constant challenge. So I'm very happy to discuss with four very experienced regulators the topic of responsible gaming to start the sessions of discussions tomorrow. And I'd like to introduce them to you. First of all, I'd like to introduce Ms. Marina Yanikuri. Marina serves as Head of Remote Game Responsible Gaming and Social Responsibility at the Gaming and Casino Supervision Commission since its establishment in 2017. With the opening of the temporary casino in 2018 in Limassol and the satellites in other districts, it has been a great parallel journey for both the regulator and the operator and, for our, and, and, and their focus on how the transition of integrated casino resorts in 2022 works where responsible gaming poses new challenges. You will recognize Marina from the first smile today on this podium this morning. 
Second smile will be provided by Dr. Anders Basbel, who is a theoretical physicist and cosmopologist uh, and joined the Danish Gambling Authority in 2016. Anders has worked on the reporting criteria for sending live data on especially perimutual batting, which is horse racing, as well as data demands for online bingo. Currently, he's working on a very interesting project on a new platform to analyze game data, one process of which is to see to which degree problematic gambling is predictable. The DGA wants to look at its game data itself in order to understand what is possible to do for the license holders in the prevention of problematic gambling. Certainly, the third smile today is coming from Mrs. Anne Meyer, who has many years of experience with the Kanspil Authority, the, uh, the uh, uh, Dutch regulator, almost eight years, in her current provision, uh, position and serves as a coordinating advisor for the Netherlands Gaming Authority. And last but not least, our fourth smile this morning comes from Mr. Spiros Tsakonitis, who serves as a senior legal advisor of the NBA, National Batting Authority of Cyprus, and will introduce some very interesting technical aspects to the audience and to us later. Uh, so first of all, we're speaking to Marina Yannikori. And Hi, uh, probably I, I raised the questions first, otherwise we're losing time. Marina, uh, in March this year, the Gaming and Casino Supervision Commission established the first prevention and treatment center for problem and pathological gambling in collaboration with the National Addictions Authority in Cyprus. How does your organization work towards harm prevention and minimization in terms of policies and or actions? Okay, uh, well, hello to everyone. Uh, a brief introduction to who we are and what we do. Um, as the Gaming and uh, Casino Supervision Commission, we are the regulator of land-based casinos in Cyprus. In terms of responsible gambling, we have two main responsibilities. Uh, the first one is to approve and monitor the casino's responsible gambling program to ensure that the implemented policies and measures are compliant with the legislation and that they are effective in the prompt prevention and minimization of gambling-related risks. And the second one is to ensure that our, uh, through our responsible gambling strategy, we as the Commission identify, prevent and address uh, problem gambling to protect the society from uh, the potential erosion into gambling harm, which uh, leads us to our responsible gambling strategy plan. Um, our responsible gambling strategy plan is built on three pillars. That's prevention, treatment and deterrence of illegal gaming. As far as uh, prevention is concerned, we work with other stakeholders, government and non-government organizations, to deliver preventative uh, actions, focusing particularly on vulnerable groups and the underage. With regards to treatment, uh, the responsible government body for the provision of treatment services to those who experience problem gambling is the National uh, Addictions Authority. The Commission does not provide treatment, and we need to make clear of that, to those in it, but uh, as we have committed through our responsible gambling strategy, we support financially and otherwise those who are professionals to provide the services in Cyprus. Which leads us to uh, Faro Center. Uh, with the initiative of our commission, uh, we established, like you said, uh, last March, the Faro Center for the Prevention and Treatment of uh, Problematic and uh, Pathological Gambling in the municipality of Ayas Athanasios in the district of Limassol, where the casino resort will operate. Um, Pharos is the Greek word for lighthouse, so it symbolizes in a way the light in the difficult journeys that one might travel, losing sometimes the destination. So the ultimate purpose of our center, of Pharos Center, is to guide and support any person who might need direction to stay on track as far as problem and pathological gambling is concerned. The works of the center, uh, parallel to the strategic structure of our uh, responsible gambling work are based on two pillars, prevention and treatment. The Cyprus Gaming and Casino Supervision Commission leads the prevention pillar. We provide information regarding gambling-related risk and potential harm, and we design and deliver independently or through synergies with other stakeholders, prevention programs for the wider society or for more specific social groups. The second pillar of uh, treatment is under the responsibility of the National Addictions Authority of Cyprus, and the services of counseling, treatment, and support are provided for free uh, through the professionals of NGO Genthea, 
who were selected by the National Addictions Authority after a tender procedure. The center operates nine to seven, five days a week, and personal and group meetings for individuals who face problem gambling issues can attend, as well as their families, and they are arranged through appointments. Also, I would like to um, note here that we have, uh, since last year, a helpline 1422, which has been in collaboration, has been established in collaboration with our commission, the National Addictions Authority in Kenthea, with the support of the operator. And this is a free helpline uh, that provides information, support, and uh, guidance to those who experience uh, problems with their gambling activity, but also to their friends and family who might be indirectly affected by problematic gambling. Similar to the center, the helpline operates daily from nine to seven, and the calls are handled by psychologists and social workers who have been trained for this purpose. Another partner in this project is the Nicosia Development Agency with the prospect of expanding the works of the center in other districts in the future, starting with Nicosia, where we have the largest satellite uh, casino. Due to COVID-19 restrictions, the official opening of the center was postponed like many other events. And uh, it will be officially, uh, it has been officially programmed for this Saturday, the 9th of October, uh, at the municipality of Ayos Athanasios in Limassol. And it takes place during Safer Gambling Week, which the commission has supported since the first year. And we will be hosting panel discussions with academics, treatment providers, and experts uh, by experience from Finland, and trainings to the casino staff and uh, the treatment professionals. So you're more than welcome to, to join us on Saturday if you're in Cyprus, if you're in Limassol. And um, we'll be very happy to see you. Thank you very much. It's great news to see this this very time. It's opening during the Safer Gambling Week, so it can't be a, a better timing. And I'm keen to learn about your first experiences next year's time when you look back and see how the first year elaborated a successful project. Thank you very much, Maria, for introducing this to us. Probably there are questions later when the Q&A session starts, which I recommend we do probably about 10 minutes before the session expires. I'd, like, I'd now like to move to Dr. Anders Basbol. Uh, because that, that's, that's interesting to learn that you're currently working on a new platform to analyze game data. It's one purpose of which is to see to which degree problematic gambling is predictable. I think this is really exciting. And uh, your authority, the Danish Gambling Authority, wants to look at, 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 at its game data itself in order to understand what is possible to do for the license holders and the prevention of problematic gambling. Could you please elaborate a little on your new self-exclusion system, Rofus, that you're running, and on this um, research regarding technologies and data connection, please? Yeah, I shall uh, try, and thank you very much for the invitation to, to join today in this uh, panel. Um, if we take Rofus first, that is a system we've had for uh, since the liberalization in 2012. And it works in the way that a player can self-exclude for 24 hours or one, three or six months or for permanently, but permanently, then you can um, then you can get out again after a year. But the concept is that if you exclude from one, you can exclude uh, at our place and then you are excluded from all online casinos in Denmark and you're uh, excluded from uh, online betting and from the land-based casinos. So it means every time a Dane logs into his online account, then they check with us whether he has registered, he or she has registered since uh, the last login. And if they have, then they can't play at all. And that gives them this, um, I think it gives the license holders kind of peace of mind that if they try to say some, something to a gambler and maybe they end up self-excluding, then they don't go over, over to the other side of the street, so to speak, and find another provider. Uh, on the gaming, on the, on the analysis we do on our data, um, we have a duty of attention to our license holders, which means that they have to supervise, uh, they have to look, surveil uh, the gambling patterns of the users. That means they have to use several parameters and analyze and see if people need uh, some help uh, so that we prevent uh, problematic gambling. We have a lot of data also at our place, not everything. We don't have something like deposits and uh, withdrawals, but we do have some gambling, gambling data when people are making bets and what they win and that kind of thing. So what we try to do is to see 
can we also analyze for some measures we can take and see, okay, this person looks like having a 30-day break that may be uh, that they have registered, registered for Rufus. Can we predict that? And we want to do that because we want to kind of walk a mile in, in the shoes of the license holders here and to see how easy or difficult is it to kind of uh, elaborate with these uh, um, patterns so we know what kind of demand uh, we can reasonably uh, ask of them. We've had a data transition lately, so it has been on a standstill for a bit, but uh, but that is our intention to try to look at this and see also what we can come up with and see what parameters uh, are predictable and, and so on. Still in its infancy, but we think it's it's very exciting. A prospect and we want to help uh, protect our uh, our gamblers together with the industry I think you're on mute Jörg. Dr. Hoffman, I think you're on mute. Can you unmute Sorry, I was your unmute. microphone? Yes. Okay. I'll repeat okay. my question. Thank you. Will, will this system provide some immediate results in real time so that uh, you could draw immediate action, or will it be designed mainly for a uh, purpose of evaluation, to review, and then look at the files and draw some conclusions for the future? Uh, it will not give immediate results and uh, the responsibility to act towards the single gambler. We don't know the gamblers anyway. The responsibility to act towards the gamblers uh, are from the companies. But we want to have an idea about what kind of, uh, how good, especially if you use machine learning, for instance, how, how good algorithms can you expect uh, to have so we kind of understand also the troubles, the issues you are facing when you're having such uh, a system. We also note that, that uh, there are now some more products that you can pass by into uh, where some of these things have already been programmed. But uh, uh, we hope to learn something about, do, could we find a new, in, could we be lucky and find a new indicator, for instance, from our data and kind of share knowledge if, if we find something, but also simply to have a look at how easy is it, how, how easy is it to, uh, to get the algorithms to give uh, good results, to know a bit about that and be able to understand also what the license holders are telling us about uh, the uh, possible problems they might be facing. But that's, that's much about the interaction between the parameters you're looking at. So I assume uh, it would be required that you provide some guidance to the industry how to work with this, uh, these results probably. Is there any idea how this could be communicated in the future? Yes, we develop our guidance uh, regularly. That means we write, for instance, that we would like uh, that when we say gambling patterns, it's not enough to have deposits and withdrawals. It must also be uh, something more specific. It could be uh, stakes and winnings. It could be time of day. It could be type of game played and something like that. So we do say some um, um, variables that we think are interesting. But it doesn't mean that it has to be exactly those that the companies are using. They get, they are free to use other things. But we we try to guide them here to say that and to say that you need to have different variables and you need to check that it works and that kind of thing. But also we are keen to learn about what does work, so we gradually all can learn more and get some better variables and getting some better help to the players in in the last end. That's the whole point of it. Sounds like an excellent project. Thank you very much, Anders. I'll get back to you in a minute. Uh, regarding the manual surveillance and machine learning AI. This is made very interesting as well. But let me first talk to um, Mrs. Meyer, Anna Meyer, uh, from the Netherlands. It's an interesting, very exciting times in the Netherlands because the um, first license operators launched the product now under the license, 1st of October. The Dutch Remote Gambling Act came into force on 1st of April this year. And... Uh, so far, I can say that Netherlands is one of the last countries in Europe to legalize online gaming. Same with our country, Germany, we are almost on the same track. We are licensing gaming. We call that virtual slot machine instead of online casino because it's a reduced format. It is uh, licensable now. So things happen in Europe. But your new act doesn't only legalize online gaming. Your authority also has got much more enforcement tools in place. The most important of these new legal provisions is the power to block payment transactions between illegal operators 
and players by issuing legally binding instructions to payment service providers. Would you like to point out some specific Dutch measures here, probably starting with the anti-addiction measures? Yes, thank you. Yes, um, as you pointed out, indeed, last uh, Friday, the uh, the online, uh, the Dutch Remote Gambling Act came into force. Uh, I mean, I have to say it more precisely, it came into force last April, but uh, last um, October, the 1st of October, the new licenses were uh, allowed on the, on the market. We have a very uh, uh, extensive set of anti-addiction measures, but I will point out the three most important. One of them is the consultation of experts. All the three markets, uh, and I mean with the three, uh, the uh, I mean the most uh, uh, that offer the most addictive games. That is the Dutch land-based casino, Holland Casino, uh, the slot machine halls, and the online gambling markets, uh, online gambling operators. They have to uh, consult experts uh, when making their policy, their anti-addiction policy. So, when making their policy, and also in the in the in the operation and the evaluation of it. They need to consult uh, experts on addiction as well as uh, former gambling addicts. And they have to prove to our authority uh, that they did this and how they did this and what they did with these advices. So I think in a lot of other countries, uh, other, uh, this, is, this also is also the case, but it is a quite unique Dutch um, requirement that is, a, that is prescribed by law that these experts need to be consulted every every time and uh, every year again. Um, the second, I think, is quite a unique Dutch requirement is the risk analysis. Uh, not only the online operators, but also uh, the Holland Casino and the slot machine halls. It's always the three, what we call the more addictive markets, need to make a risk assessment of their uh, whole um, yeah, games of chance, all, all, all they offer. And they have to use a scientifically based tool that um, assesses these risks and they have to uh, use this, uh, the outcome uh, for their marketing and anti-addiction policy. And the third one is exclusion. Uh, we talked about it before. Um, uh, but also the Netherlands will have this general exclusion. In Dutch, it's called crux. Uh, it's, uh, that is, uh, to translate it, it's the central register for exclusion. Um, it's again uh, limited to the three more addictive games of chance, so Holland Casino, the slot machine halls, and online gambling markets. Uh, they need to check this register before they allow uh, people to, game, to play. What is also quite unique in the Netherlands, I think, is that we, there's also involuntary exclusion. Uh, the basis and the most common will be the voluntary exclusion, so that, that people decide themselves to do this, to protect themselves from further harm. But also uh, people um, might, in some cases, be protected against their will. And that means that um, uh, operators or uh, family, friends can uh, do a kind of request and the, our authority has to decide upon uh, these requests. Um, we published uh, a couple of months ago, I think two, three months ago, a, a policy guideline on this. And um, we will consult experts, we ourselves will consult experts to give advice on these specific cases and objection and appeal in court uh, against uh, these decisions is possible. Um, as far as marketing is concerned, there's a lot of th things to say about that too. I, will know that I won't do that here, but what I will say is that we have already made several appeals against uh, gambling operators to limit the amount of marketing and advertising they aim at customers. Uh, gambling operators must not uh, uh, push the boundaries of the law and if the adverts encourage excessive gambling or if the adverts are deceptive, then, the, uh, then our authority uh, can and also will uh, intervene. I think that is my most important message for now. Thank you very much. Probably we should also talk about the, the 
affordability topic. Uh, if players can afford playing, um, this yeah. is of course different from player to player. In our country, we've got deposit limits in place now where you can exempt from if you're granted uh, an approval by the regulator. It's quite questioned because uh, uh, the affordability is really individually different. Um, do you think that the, the, the industry needs to monitor, to investigate the affordability of its own players? Is there some, some guidance or some regulation in place uh, in order to make sure that people can only spend what they can afford? Yeah, that is a very good and very relevant and actual question. Um, what we also um, um, made ourselves, there's the law, the new law, but there's also a, a guideline from our authority. We published it in large, uh, last uh, April. And in this guideline on um, anti-addiction measures and also marketing um, requirements, we wrote that if a customer is in financial need, you must intervene. That is a, a one of the cases, you must intervene. But the question is, of course, what is financial need and how can you know uh, when a person uh, is in financial need? And uh, because we all know that some people have more money than others, etc. So um, we are, um, we, uh, are um, the, thinking about making um, more regulation on this, but we'll... The, the, the thing is that um, there's also this privacy and practical issue. You can't uh, ask customers to give all their uh, financial details, but you must um, determine certain patterns. That's the most important. So you must, as an operator, and on the, in this respect, we have regulation. We have a lot of regulation, uh, uh, like also the Danish have. Um, they have to detect if the pattern of gambling changes, and they have to... Uh, sent us data on this too. So that is a good basis, I think. Um, and we will follow the, um, also the scientific and other uh, developments in this case. And it might be in the future that we will uh, make more detailed uh, regulation on this. But um, for now, the most important is that they have to determine changes in, in gambling patterns and to convince us about this. And also if payment method methods change for example you pay now with this and then with that etc that, that is also a, a red it should be a red flag so um to answer your question uh, briefly um we don't have detailed regulation on uh, affordability checks right now uh, but we are following all the developments in um, on this subject Excellent. Thank you very much. So we, everything is looking at the, the development side and progress and what, what's going on to be, um, well, to be unthinkable today, but realistic in the future. Uh, Sparrows, um, the NBA is looking into the future as well. You've developed safer gambling standards, which is sort of a similar structure to the ISA framework system. Uh, you commissioned two studies from the University of Nicosia for the implementation of new technologies, in particular blockchain. I think this is really interesting. Um, technology drives the industry. While legislators usually are way behind, you're already addressing the challenges ahead. So this includes the blockchain technology, of course, and AI probably. And how will gambling be affected by blockchain in the future, and how are you preparing for it? Good morning, Jörg. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, we are convinced that the early adoption of blockchain, both by the industry and by the regulator, is something that is necessitated by the current momentum in the European Union. Blockchain is one of the key new technologies which may help shape the future of the continent. It's something that is mentioned in the European blockchain strategy and something that we are seeing more and more in the new regulations and directives that come out, be it the AML directive, which contains clauses about virtual assets, or the EIDAS uh, electronic identification card, which now includes the SSI bridge. So we're definitely moving towards that direction, and uh, it's something that is mirrored in our national blockchain strategy. And I must say we're in the final days of the blockchain act uh, consultation. So we're moving towards that direction and we're following the continent in that. Uh, it's, I mean, 
I should note that the direct, when the Director General said that Europe's ambition is to become the gold standard in, in matters revolving around blockchain. So for us, an investment in blockchain reflects Europe's ambition and at the same time uh, gives our operators a um, comparative advantage. Um, and, and that is a far cry from what we were used to talk, what we were used to talk about when we used to talk about blockchain. I remember in EIG, like four years ago, I don't know if you were present as well, Mr. York, uh, there was a panel discussion um, about blockchain and how, what did that mean, what would that mean for the future of the industry? And it was a really dark panel. Uh, they were talking about operators moving underground, uh, decentralized casinos with no jurisdictions, uh, the absolution, the absolution of uh, regulators. Uh, but that's all behind us. Now we're talking about enhanced transparency, enhanced fairness, um, and even a better compliance, if I may add. Um, but back to your question, what, what will it mean for the future of the industry? Uh, how, how will it affect it? Um, we believe that the effects are going to be threefold. It will, of course, uh, affect the player experience. Uh, it will affect the, the way the operators conduct their inner procedures and the way that regulators uh, supervise the industry. In terms of the player experience, uh, we believe that the change will be revolutionary, but in subtle ways. It will, create, it will establish an environment where um, a frictionless environment for the player from onboarding all the way to withdrawals. Uh, it will eliminate disputes at a large percentage because a lot of the procedures are going to be automated via smart contracts, which are going to be first tested in a regulatory sandbox and then licensed by the authority. Um, at the same time, it will establish uh, more trust between the players and the operators because the players will be able to assess in real time the fairness of the draws of the RNGs. Uh, and of course, the, the authority is planning to create tools which will enable the players to determine the fairness. And last but not least, uh, it will create the environment for a holistic approach of uh, safer gambling tools. And if you want, I can elaborate on that. But in, moving on on the, how it will affect the operators, uh, we believe that the inner procedures and the way that the, the, the industry is regulated is going to change in a, in a big way because a lot of the procedures are going to be automated via smart contracts, which will, will, will reflect regulation in a large way. And um, in a way, they will automate compliance. I don't know if that makes sense. I can provide an example, though. Um, just imagine a situation, uh, I'll just give an example from the betting law. Uh, there is a condition in our betting law that within 30, uh, if, the, if the player does not complete his KYC in the first 30 days, uh, the operator has to suspend the account. Just imagine a situation where that is automated via a smart contract. Uh, and that smart contract, the contents of it, can create a unique hash, which works like a footprint. So when that smart contract is licensed by the authority and then deployed in the market, uh, the authority can at any time notice when that hash is ch has changed. So compliance becomes, becomes kind of automatic, if you like. And uh, that's, that's really cost effective, cost efficient for both the operator and the regulator. It's very interesting. We see something big is coming up. To some of us, it may be far away, but uh, it's a bit, a bit like uh, 40 years ago and uh, discussing mobile phones, and now everybody is using it. Um, since we are exactly. running out of time, slightly running out of time, I'd like to, to stick to our 45 minutes. We started with a small delay, but uh, uh, I'd like to get back to Anders. First of all, uh, the affordability checks in, in Denmark, which is a, a long-standing, the Danish model, a long-standing regulation. I'm pretty sure you can add a few words on that from your jurisdiction as well. And if some final words about AI, uh, this would be nice to close the panel discussions. If there are any questions, happy to take them. 
but uh, first listen to what you can contribute to these two topics again. Well, uh, on the first one, not much, I'm afraid, because I don't believe we do have affordability checks as such. We have, of course, uh, some anti-money laundry obligations um, there. Uh, the, um, how can I say? Uh, the gambling operators also have to have to have this look about preventing um, gambling, so they can interfere with the person's uh, gambling. For instance, if they have a strange pattern, and of course, in that sense, then it comes, then it could be a criteria that they could include. But otherwise, it's also a bit outside my my expertise. Right. In this case, we move to Marina later for but, a final word because I know she's yeah. got something to tell. But maybe AI, yes. if you can just yes. one two lines, would be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, AI, and I guess. When I say AI, I would normally mean something like artificial neural networks or something like that. If we take it more broadly as machine learning, I think it's a very efficient tool um, for uh, for making quick decisions that is categorizing in problematic and non-problematic gamblers, for instance. But what's, what must be, it's very good and it's good to use it, but what must be remembered is that it's, it is never better than the original judgment. judgment. It is trained so it's, for instance, trained on uh, to replicate either what psychologists have uh, have decided or what people looking at gam um, employees at the gambling companies have uh, previous decided or some other criteria, and then they are replicating that. So it's replicating uh, judgments that otherwise would have been made by by humans. So you also need to look at you cannot only use look at using ai which is perfectly fine to do and it's good quality but you must also look at the original judgments it's a combination thank you very much marina one minute before we return to the, the panel uh, regarding afford affordability checks please well it's actually more of a, a closing remark uh, because uh, when i heard the affordability checks i was just thinking that last week we hosted the gref the gaming regulators Euro European Forum, the Working Group for Responsible Gambling. And the topic on the agenda was affordability checks. And uh, it was a topic that was chosen by most, most, uh, most of our members. It's a topic that we all uh, need to share information and uh, experience on. So uh, I just wanted to stress out the, the importance of, uh, of the regulators coming together and sharing their experience and sharing what worked, what didn't work. And uh, this is what uh, I just uh, wanted to say that it's it's good to uh, to see that uh, we we are in a position where we can have uh, gatherings like this, where we can have conversations like this, and we can have working groups where we can see in practice issues that uh, we need to uh, work on in our uh, everyday work in responsible gambling. Thank you very much. I think all in all, this was a wonderful overview on various topics that are exciting and timely. Thank you very much, my panelists, for your wonderful contributions. I really appreciate it this morning. Our 45 minutes speaking time are over, and I'm happy to return the panel to the chairperson. Thank you very much, and hope to see you soon in person. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hoffman, for your excellent uh, moderating skills. Thank you. Thank you so much. It is time for me to introduce Dr. Kim Muritsen for her presentation on AI and neuroscience for preventing gambling addiction. Dr. Kim Muritsen is the founder of Mindway AI in Denmark. Dr. Muritsen. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you so much for the opportunity to speak at this conference. Thank you to the organizers. Um, the question that I'm interested in and the team I'm representing here is how can we use the latest research and proven uh, psychological know-how to detect and prevent gambling addiction? I think that's sort of the, the holy grail of uh, this, this meeting also. And I would like to add one more thing. I would like to add that we would like to do this in real time. So I perfectly agree with Anas uh, and, and the panel uh, from before that it's uh, really, really key that we are able to assess uh, the material that goes into AI algorithms. And this is a reason that we are combining AI with neuroscience and psychological know-how. We have spent um, 
something around uh, 20 years researching the brain in different settings. So we have been researching how the brain regions communicate with each other, uh, with electricity, with uh, neurotransmitters. We have been trying to understand blood flow. We have been trying to understand neuronal uh, activity and organization. And really what we're most interested is in, in taking on that research and then bringing it into to practice so it doesn't just become uh, papers. And in 2013, we actually uh, created a medtech company where we built a virtual radiologist that can basically make the same decisions automatically that an experienced radiologist can. And then in 2018, we established Mindway and we use the same idea. So we are building a virtual psychologist so a machine that can basically make decisions about as well as a human psychologist, but of course, without getting tired, without getting biased and so on. And now if you don't um, trust that external factors can actually change our brain, can change our neuronal wiring and our behavior, uh, then I have one example here that I found is very interesting. It's also harmless here because it's actually not gambling in itself. Uh, this is the question of what happens uh, as they're looking at screens, so typically uh, telephones. Uh, as you can see here, what it does, it's actually a remarkable effect here. It actually disorganizes the connections between different brain regions. And all in, in, in all can, can make brain networks less efficient. So this is not gambling related, but this is just to show that even smaller uh, stimuli than, than gambling can actually change our brains, especially in, in kids who, who are extremely susceptible because their brains are developing. Let's look a little bit about um, what, what's actually happening in the brain as we are developing addiction. And this is really to, to bridge um, from neuroscience and then to artificial intelligence and how we can employ this with gambling operators. There are a couple of regions that are involved um, first of all, you have probably heard about dopamine as the neurotransmitter uh, that's uh, responsible for uh, feelings of reward. I'll see if I can draw here. I think I'm drawing now, at least on my own screen. Uh, so there's a reading here in, in deep, deep in, in the brainstem. This is actually where that dopamine is released. And then the important bit here is the nucleus accumbens. So that's a little thing here sitting uh, not far from the eyes. This is actually where we feel pleasure. Uh, this can be when we listen to music, um, when we eat great food, or when we have sex. So this is really a basic pleasure center in the brain. <clears throat> and then connecting these two very primitive areas of the brain where we are um, stimulating and feeling um, pleasure, we have the frontal cortex out here. This is called the CEO of the brain. This is where we presumably make rational decisions. And you can imagine that um, developing addiction is a matter of getting an imbalance between sort of the rational part of the brain and then sort of the more impulse related and pleasure related centers in the brain. And that's, um, those are all complex um, processes, but, but what's important to note here that is that it's not only when we experience a reward from our environment. So it's not only when we have a big monetary reward it happens that it's also the prediction of reward. So just expecting to soon receive a reward is something that actually generates a pleasurable stimulus in the brain. So we expect that as, or we um, experience that as um, stimulating and rewarding. So this is why gambling is so potent. This is why gambling uh, can relatively easily lead to addiction. One trick especially that, that we know neuroscientifically is very effectful is um, the unanticipated rewards. So even though you get a sense of pleasure as you are expecting a reward, if you are not expecting it and then getting it, uh, then that pleasure is all that much bigger. And I think we all know that when we get an unexpected uh, compliment or if you surprise uh, your partner with flowers, I think that that can have a tremendous uh, effect. So we, we know that when we get some unexpected reward, that actually has a, um, a big influence on the brain. And what then happens is that um, these things escalate. Um, so we start to 
uh, have a sensation of reward even when we are not getting it. That means our attraction to this stimulus, so our want to gamble more becomes bigger and bigger. And as the want becomes bigger and bigger, you could say that the liking, the payoff becomes smaller and smaller. So the gap between how much we actually want to play and how much we enjoy it, how much we, we actually get out of it, that gap becomes bigger and bigger. And that's essentially the recipe for uh, addiction. And it actually turns out that for problem gamblers, even losing money uh, is associated with a feeling of reward. So it's very unwanted, but nevertheless, that's what the brain experiences. So that's a little bit about the um, sort of the biology between uh, behind addiction. Now, the, the question is, can we use this in practice or to start somewhere else? Where are we right now? Where are operators right now? And how can we then build an AI system that makes use of all this knowledge? So as Anas and, and, and the uh, other panelists just discussed, um, where we are today, uh, we're looking at um, risk markers. And imagine that we're looking at an, an individual risk marker that could be uh, the, money, the, the amount of money that has been spent in a given period. Then you can rank, of course, customers according to that uh, risk marker. But it's not going to be very satisfactory because you're going to see lots of people who spend a lot of money, but they're not necessarily problem gamblers. So the natural next step is to say, well, then we'll take a couple of risk markers or we'll take five or, or, or 10 risk markers. So they're the traditional markers of harm. But we are not going to still run into problems um, because we have to fix thresholds. We have to say, well, we have a number of markers, but which value should the first have to be problematic? Which value should the next one have to be problematic and so on? Moreover, as Anna's also mentioned, you know, who should set these thresholds? Who should fix these numbers? Should that be the operators? Should it be regulators? Who should this be? And even more complicated, I think, how do these um, markers interact with each other? So it's not looking at people as one-dimensional um, creatures. It's, it's about understanding the complexity behind each individual. So, I have a very, very simple slide here to explain what, what AI is and what it can do. And it, it's so simple that, that you are welcome to, to make fun of it. Uh, but this is just to get us all on, on the same page. So what we can do with AI, we can take complicated data, uh, like you know emitting data, for instance. And, and if we can see if an expert or, or just a human here uh, can see that this is a cat, well, then we can build an AI system to reproduce that. What it takes is that the target is clear. Um, so if we can all agree on the target, then we can for sure very likely build such an AI system. But that's not the case in problem gambling. Um, so we do have tons of data, but it's not so clear cut who are the problem gamblers and, and who are just at risk. And so this is where it all comes together because what we are proposing is that we should go to experts. We should go to psychologists who work with problem gamblers and treat problem gamblers, not least, day in and day out, uh, every day of the year. And we should talk to and understand um, uh, researchers in the field. So they're really bringing the, the most novel uh, research and, and knowledge to the table. So what we are doing uh, with Mindway is that we are asking experts to review gambling data on an individual basis, not a population basis, but actually looking at individual gambling histories as they uh, um, appear in a digital footprint and then make an assessment whether this is probably problematic or probably not problematic. So I usually compare this to people going to your, when you go to your general uh, physician, to, to your family doctor, they will also make an assessment not based on your blood values uh, alone or any other single one dimensional measurement, but it's going to be a holistic assessment based on who is presenting here and, and what are then more hardcore uh, markers. So what we do in particular is that we work with gambling operators. We uh, get a stack of data, um, unbiased and selected by us. Uh, and we have this data reviewed by our panel of experts. They follow consensus guidelines in, in order to, to reach a decision for each customer. And then based on this data set uh, where we now have um, where we now have expert assessment and we have raw data. I don't know if these videos can play, but, but the idea here is that now we have a system that can in real time uh, sift through um, thousands of, of data points 
and make assessments that are congruent with expert assessment. What we have done recently is to open our books to gaming laboratories and in international uh, for third party validation of our performance on concrete data. And I think this is another uh, way we can go uh, in order to ensure objectivity, uh, independence, and, and not least that the values that we are getting are actually representative. And what we had confirmed for this data set is that uh, more than 88% of uh, players who are manually affected by the um, by the experts are also caught by the algorithm, and vice versa. Uh, by far most, so 87% of subjects that are detected with this system uh, would also be detected by a human expert, except that of course they wouldn't have the time to do this uh, real time and formal operators. So I think we can say here that we have a very high congruency between expert assessment and the machine. Now, it's also very important that such a system is able to explain itself. So I think we have all heard uh, that uh, one of the concerns with artificial intelligence is that it might be a black box. We cannot understand its decisions. They might be even better than, than human decision making. But the big problem is that we just don't understand the decisions. And now that becomes a problem for operators because operators need to communicate to end users why they are suddenly uh, coming up and being contacted by the staff uh, at an operator. It's not enough to say that they were flagged by an algorithm. <clears throat> now, what we do is that we actually ask our experts for each decision they're making to flag why they're making this decision. And they have a number of items to choose from. And that means uh, that in effect, uh, we have a system that can give you a risk score uh, similar to a human expert, but it can also give you the reason why. And I think this is very important and goes a long way in bettering the dialogue between uh, gambling operators and end users. Now, the final point I want to, to get to here is that, um, of course, this tool uh, can be used to monitor. Um, so as you can see here, we, we have dashboards where the AI uh, based on the expert decisions um, can then show the distribution of how many um, you know, harmless playing patterns are we seeing and, and how many do we see that are, are, are surely problematic. You can see that distribution here and of course it's only a minority here that, that are very serious. We can also start to understand what are the typical problems. So we show that in, in these radar plots here and I don't have the time to go into detail but you can see that you know, under normal circumstances, all parameters here uh, assessed by the experts are basically under control. And then they start as risk increases. You can see how they start to, uh, to, to differ and become more and more abnormal. But I think it's a very interesting question how um, addiction develops. And to that end, we, we have a case here where you can see this is time progressing uh, in this direction and then time progressing uh, furthermore down here. And you can see that this is a gambler who is transitioning from very harmless, very low risk score here. And then something starts to happen. What you can see here is that um, it's a player who starts to deposit more and more. There is a system of deposits upon losses. You can see a system of loss chasing. What you can also see here is that the time of day, this is the time of day you can see here, time of day is also increasing uh, into more peculiar times of the day. And that all means that we see gradually more and more a loss of control. So you can see, we can also use this system now to understand how addiction is developing and we can use it to communicate at different time points. I mean, this time point here, for instance, would, would be my recommendation to say to this particular individual, something is going on, let me explain what we are seeing. Uh, this is based on an expert system and let's talk about how we can uh, how we can remedy this. So it begs the question, could we also have anticipated this? Um, as, uh, basically asked the same question and, and, and York uh, asked this also. So right now we are monitoring and that has a big value of course and we can have the uh, dialogue with the end user but could we also have foreseen it? Because once we get into that red area, it's simply too late. So what we're asking here is, can you take that first snippet of data and then predict what happens down the line? And we're working on, on, on this exactly. So we're basically working on predicting what experts will assess in the future. So we are trying to now become better than the experts. And in one uh, case we're working on here, we have seen that in 59% of players were actually changing 
um, behavior into a more risky behavior, we can actually predict that one month ahead. So that actually gives a lot of leeway for an operator to intervene before this escalates and becomes more difficult to handle. So in summary, um, we do believe uh, that we can use AI to create fully automated real-time detection systems. Uh, we do believe uh, that we have shown here that you can base it on uh, the latest scientific knowledge and you can keep it current uh, by, by updating these um, algorithms continuously as new uh, information comes in and becomes uh, practice. Uh, we also believe that it's very important that such systems can explain themselves and preferably along the lines of trained psychological experts. And then I think where this field is moving is very interesting. We will do more and more in terms of predicting development. We'll predict events before they actually happen. And this is really the true strength of artificial intelligence and where we can even go beyond experts and make really intelligent systems. So thank you so much for uh, your attention. I hope I'm still relatively much on time. And of course, I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Moritzen. We will now move on to our second panel discussion on safer gambling standards and methods of enhanced player protection. The panel will be moderated by Trudy Smith Kosai, CEO at Grail Canada. Across the gambling industry, countries are implementing and suggesting safer gambling standards with the goal to enhance player protection. How can these standards benefit players and operators? What are the biggest challenges and opportunities for moving towards a universal application to all jurisdictions? How can we move towards a more sustainable gambling environment? Ms. Kosai, the floor is yours. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. And th thank you for the chance to join all of you today at the fourth annual Safer Gambling Conference. Uh, as you mentioned, I am Trudy smith Cose and I'm CEO of GRIO. And GRIO is a global partner in research, evidence, and evaluation to advance safer gambling. This session is a panel on safer gambling standards as a method to uh, enhance player protection. And I'm really happy to welcome our three panelists, uh, Vasiliki Panusi from the European Gaming and Betting Association, Haley Smith with Safer Gambling Standards Scam Care, and Mark Pace of the Gambling Standards Association. Uh, each of these associations take a slightly different approach to standards. And I'd like to kick off the panel by asking each of you to give a brief picture of your approach uh, could we start with Vasiliki, please? Sure. Uh, hello, Haley. Hello, everyone. Um, I want to make sure that you can hear me, <laughs> but I think yes. you can hear me. Yeah, great. That's perfect. Uh, it's, a, it's an honor again for me to participate uh, in this uh, conference. Very interesting presentation so far. Uh, impressive presentation on artificial intelligence. Um, uh, so, yeah, speaking about standards, um, and maybe a brief introduction about uh, EGBA, the European Gaming and Betting Association. Uh, we are a Brussels-based association. We represent online uh, betting companies, six leading online betting companies. Um, and um, on top of, I would say, the traditional lobbying work that we do, um, meaning the interference with uh, European and national policies and regulation. We are also driving uh, a number of significant in initiatives uh, on the sector. Uh, many of those have to do with uh, responsible gambling. Um, uh, unfortunately, we don't have the time, so I can analyze each one of them, but uh, maybe I can briefly mention the work that we are doing in the uh, European uh, Standardization Committee. Uh, we are involved, first of all, in the work that is now finalized on a standard about reporting obligations. We are, uh, most importantly, preparing a new uh, standardization proposal that will have to do with markers of harm. Um, again, on responsible gambling, it will be about harm prevention. Uh, for the first time this year, we also conducted a sustainability report. Um, which you can find, uh, everyone can access online on our website. It is basically um, 
a very explanatory overview of what our member companies are doing on responsible gambling. It's also sharing the objectives uh, about safe gambling in the future. And uh, it's also, it also aggregates uh, a lot of data about responsible gambling. For example, it's worth noting that uh, during the last years, we have noticed an increase of 166% on uh, operator player communication on safer gambling and also an increase from 63 to 75% of uh, the use of voluntary um, safer gambling tools, such as limits, uh, deposit limits, time limits, self-exclusions. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's very interesting to notice that. It's very interesting to notice that players also, when they are aware, they are able to make use of such tools which are not always legal requirements. It's also up to the operators to, to provide them. And maybe uh, very quickly, um, uh, the, I can also mention the work that we're doing for a code of conduct on responsible advertising, um, which is it's published, it's, uh, it's finalized, uh, and it will be monitored. Compliance is currently being monitored and analyzed um, and we also have a code on uh, data protection uh, we are preparing a code of data protection um, i don't know if i have much time to talk about the the technological standard proposal um, that we are preparing but maybe very briefly i can say that um, this, is a, this, this, this will be a technological standard in the context of the European um, uh, Standardization Committee. Uh, it, we are proposing to standardize uh, a list of um, behavioral indicators, meaning the changes of behavior, of gambling behavior that can indicate risk in order to prevent it. So it's, it's if I can use the motto, it's uh, something about detection for prevention. Uh, there is no uh, requirement of the standard to intervene with the intervention methods that then operators can use. Uh, it is only about uh, uh, which behavior should be analyzed if we want to assess uh, the risk of behaviors. Um, and these markers, for example, can concern, um, uh, for example, is there a change in the withdrawal behavior of the player? Is there a change of the deposits? Um, is there a change in the, is there an increase in the time that the player is spending online, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we are in, a, we are in a, I would say, initial phase for uh, this uh, proposal. Um, we have had uh, um, a lot of support received by uh, national regulators and national associations representing the sector. Um, and we are planning to have it uh, proposed uh, officially by the end of, the, of this year. Uh, again, I would like to mention that um, we are aware that not uh, everyone is in danger. Uh, in fact, few people uh, in, in, in reality uh, develop problem behavior, but uh, the sector should not wait uh, uh, regulatory demands. Uh, the sector should be proactive, and there should be definitely proactive pr uh, protection for those who are uh, at risk. There are very few, but there should be protection. And this is the aim of the, of the proposal. Thank you very much, Vasiki. There's a really a lot of exciting things happening uh, with your organization. Uh, Haley, could you please tell us a little bit about the Safer Gambling Standards with GamCare? Yes, of course. Um, just to briefly introduce GamCare, um, which is um, an independent charity, which is the large, largest provider of information, advice, support and treatment for those affected by gambling harms. Um, and for those that don't know, we operate the National Gambling Helpline Services. 
um, 24 hours, 365 days a year. Um, we One of our approaches to safer gambling was, was created what we call the safer gambling standard, um, which is an independent quality standard um, that assesses the measures gambling businesses have um, to put in place to protect people from those gambling related harms. And what the standard does is it covers 10 areas and up to 58 criteria, separate criteria, um, which covers the entire business model, process, practices, customer journey, um, marketing, um, you know, and we, it's, it's voluntary for operators to come to us for this standard. Um, and what it does is it identifies these operators of going above and beyond the regulations of, of the license conditions. Um, and we we accredit those businesses accordingly and there's 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 steps of accreditation which um run from base level up to level three um and i think what's important is that these businesses um voluntarily come to us um within gamcare for for this particular standard um we not only cover b to c businesses but we've now introduced the b to b version of the standard this year so that was the first launch um, and we've also, the Betting and Gaming Council, which is the trade association, have also signed up all of their members um, to take the standard over the next um, three years. Um, so we're getting that traction now with more and more operators coming along to take up our standard and really showcase their businesses um, to show consumers that they are going above and beyond those those safer gambling standards. and you know, to, to make customers realise that this is an operator um, that is worth um, going to, to, to game with, in effect, because they are um, going above and beyond those requirements. Um, and we're seeing that traction going more and more um, with operators coming on board for that kite mark um, assessment. Thank you, Haley. Uh, Mark, uh, could you please talk to us about the uh, Gaming Standards Association and your approach to safer gambling standards? Hi, ah, yes. Good morning uh, or good afternoon, depending on uh, on where you are. Uh, thank you very much for having me on this panel. Um, the International Gaming Standards Association is a nonprofit association that has been around for over 23 years. and. What we do is we work with legislators and regulators uh, whom we refer to as the policy domain. And then we work with suppliers and operators, in essence, the industry, uh, hence we call them the industry domain, um, to understand uh, and identify areas where uh, technical standards could be implemented to um, resolve issues. Uh, one, one example that has proven to be quite successful in the land-based gaming sector is the fact that we've developed a communication protocol that allows slot machines, gaming devices really, to communicate to systems using an open, um, modern, uh, high, high speed network, uh, encrypted and secure communication protocol as opposed to the many different propriety protocols that used to, co to exist in the industry and to some degree uh, still continue to exist. Um, as it pertains to safer gaming, one of the things that, that we have been working on, and, and Vasiliki mentioned this, is I was very honored to lead the uh, European Committee for Standardization's work group on the creation of that pan-European online gambling reporting standard. And that standard was developed really in support of regulators providing oversight. Uh, as the prior prevent, uh, presenter mentioned, you know, there's lots of data and data is needed for AI in order to understand um, what might be happening with an individual gambler. Um, as Vasiliki mentioned, you know, um, EGBA is working on identifying uh, markers of harm. Um, Haley mentioned the fact that um, they are using data in, in order to, you know, prevent um, harm for individuals and there are uh, not just operators but also suppliers that are coming on board. What we do is we identify those those needs such as in this case data and then we work to standardize it. And that's exactly what we did in Europe and that's what we also have done in a separate standard that IGSA has created which is the regulatory reporting interface. 
that goes beyond online to also standardize the data that is created by land-based uh, gaming uh, as well as by lottery gaming. Um, the idea here is that uh, as a regulator, as an industry, if we want to truly analyze and identify potential problem gamblers before they become problem gamblers, then we have to have standardized data that can be collected and analyzed, uh, not just at a uh, perhaps single operator level, but much more uh, at a um, industry level. Um, the, the other thing I will say about IGSA is that we have uh, offices uh, all over the world. We have offices in Macau, in Japan, uh, and in Europe, which is the one that I look after. Uh, and, and so uh, we, we truly do work uh, around the globe and, and in gaming markets uh, all over the world. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. And uh, I think you have really pulled a common thread from all of the presenters in talking about the importance of data, which is really fundamental and underwrites many of these standards. I'd like to put it out to the panel to uh, talk about the opportunities that the wealth of data that we have uh, pulling in from player data, particularly online data, what that opportunity is for us with standards, and also whether you see any risks particularly in data sharing. I don't know if you want to kick that off, Mark, or if anybody else wants to jump in. Um, I, I, can, I can start and, and then uh, defer to um, Haley and Vasilki. So um, absolutely, one of the things that um, we have to be cognizant of is that you know, we are dealing with player data. Um, there are lots of... Um, data privacy laws uh, beyond the GDPR in, in Europe. Uh, there are privacy laws in the US as well. So as we are collecting data uh, and as we are uh, making it available to organizations who have the right uh, scientific minds, uh, whether they are psychologists, psychiatrists, you know, wh wh whatever the, the appropriate discipline is, we also need to make sure that we are doing so in a manner that protects the individual uh, and aligns with the uh, laws and requirements of each individual jurisdiction. In addition to protecting the player data, we also have to protect the operators. Um, we want to make sure that operators who are providing this data uh, so that it can be analyzed, maybe using AI engines again, as, as the prior uh, presenter was explaining, um, that the operators themselves are also protected. They are not identified. Uh, and then if an individual is identified as, oh, there is an opportunity here where this person might become a problem gambler, uh, again, aligned to the laws and requirements of each jurisdiction, maybe it is at that point that a player um, identifiable information is made available. Uh, there are technologies today that can absolutely achieve that. We are working on a standard um, to, to do exactly that. And, and it is also one of the things that we will be um, uh, presenting to the European Committee for Serialization, specifically Technical Committee 456, to evaluate whether or not this is something we should work on uh, as a um, enabler, if you would, of the standard that Vasiliki mentioned. Uh, thank you, Mark. Vasiliki, uh, uh, would you like to talk a little bit about data? Has uh, Mark sort of thrown the ball over to you? Sure, Julie, thank you. Um, yes, uh, I think it's not uh, me or uh, um, I think it's, it's the majority of speakers today underlining the importance of uh, um, data. Um, and I think that we, we know that already for some years now. Um, I mean, the, the challenge is, I guess, other than complying with uh, data protection and privacy, the challenge is to make sure that we use the right data um, because there is plenty of information out there. It's uh, indeed um, very true that there are plenty of technological tools, very accurate and uh, impressive tools that the industry can use um, uh, for a good reason, for good purposes. Um, the biggest challenge in my perspective is the fact that there is a lot of um, uh, fragmentation 
and there is not real, really a common understanding on problem gambling. So um, this might sometimes lead to situations where everybody's trying to do something, but um, the, the, the root of the problem is not much comprehended. So we may end up in having um, uh, different policies, different legal requirements, different tools even um, to, uh, let's say, target the same problem. And um, this, is, this is something that standards can really facilitate. Um, uh, and this is why we are also moving on with uh, this proposal on standardization, because it is a, it is a great opportunity to bring together um, not only industry players, not only authorities, but also perhaps academics uh, or even the um, representatives from the health sector in order to understand a little bit better the, the issue uh, and the problem. Um, and, 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 and to this end, standards can be very helpful. They can be a, um, a, a toolbox, if I can say, for, uh, uh, for the sector, but also for um, authorities in order to uh, better implement their, their safer gambling policies. I think, Slika, you kind of brought it in two pieces, the data and the understanding of what harms mean and across jurisdictions. Uh, Haley, I know that uh, GAMCARE has done a really interesting approach in understanding harms and in order to pull together your standards. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that for us? Yes, of course. I mean, Vasiliki has, has kind of hit the, the nail on the head in fact that, you know, you need to understand what it is that we're looking at in terms of the data that we need in the first instance. And, and, and GAMCARE are quite, you know, because we are part of that National Helpline Services um, and, the, and the treatment um, that goes beyond that, um, we can pull a lot of that data together just to understand those trigger points, which throughout that customer journey, which, which, you know, where, at what point that they became, that problem became. And, and you know, um, we, we have a lot of information, a lot of data, um, but it, it is, it's, it's bringing that all together and, and who and how. Um, but I think, um, Vasiliki, you know, it was absolutely right. We need to make sure that we're drawing the right data. We've got a lot of different legal and regulatory requirements across many jurisdictions. Um, but, you know, um, we, we have a lot of lived experience and service users within GAMCARE where we can draw um, a lot of information from. Um, but also, you know, I think it's it's not just about the individuals and that journey. I think we could um, look at the products as well within the industry. And I think there's a lot of data to be drawn from there equally. Um, so I think, you know, you, you've got two avenues here. You've got the, the people and you've seen that the AI presentation earlier. Um, so you've got the kind of how the brain works, etc. Um, you've got all the research that can be done, but you've equally the products and the services, the gambling services and products that, that are on offer, there's a lot of data there that can be drawn as well. Um, so, so I think, you know, it, it's, it, it's quite big in terms of, but it's getting that data right. What is the data that we're pulling first before we then complement that against the standards um, that, that we can then go um, internationally with? It's uh, no small order at all. And, you know, as, as you speak, Haley, I'm really struck with uh, the rapid pace of change that's happening uh, with internationalization of gaming, uh, far more jurisdictions coming online, as well as the technological advances that uh, we're accommodating, you know, in terms of different currencies uh, and those approaches. Do you have a sense of how standards will need to evolve in order to keep pace with uh, changing technologies, changes in internationalization, and uh, changes in, in how we use data? I think we need to um, come together internationally. I think, because standards, sometimes I'm, we do talk about the legal and regulatory requirements, um, across jurisdictions. How, having said that, 
um, I believe that that when it comes to safer gambling standards, we can all join together and have the same approach in respect to standards because we're talking about people. We're not now talking about regulatory requirements. We're talking about what 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 drives a person to to get to that state um, uh, of addiction um, or even pre that. So actually, that would be the same across no matter where you are in in the world, you know. So so actually, I think there's a, there's a lot to be said for us across all jurisdictions who run these safer gambling standards programs to come together and combine our standards to to, to make it an international standard across, because it's not about legal regulatory requirements in jurisdictions. It's about the individuals. Um, and what drives those problems. Um, so I think that we can um, collectively join together and, and do something on an international basis on that, you know, based on that. Okay. And tr Trudy, if, if I, uh, Trudy, if I might yes, um, piggyback on what Haley just said, I, I think she's absolutely right. Um, one example uh, of something that is uh, pretty consistent across many different jurisdictions is the fact that there is a self-exclusion, uh, a centralized self-exclusion process um, that really is there to protect the individuals, regardless of what country um, or what culture that individual happens to be, um, you know, uh, gaming from or, or coming from. Um, and one of the things that we've been exploring as well is the idea of potentially moving uh, limits systems uh, into the same centralized arena. Um, you know, we, we often look at the incredible work that some of our members um, uh, are doing in terms of safer gambling and, and harm minimization. Um, one of our members recently was awarded a, uh, for, for the work that they've done but the, the, as good as it is, they are still dealing with looking at the activity of a player within their realm. Uh, if they have, you know, let's say online, uh, four or five, six online gaming sites, they're only seeing the player's activity with those four or five or six gaming sites. They have no idea what's going on with other um, gaming um, on, online sites. So what we're what we're exploring is is there a, an opportunity to mimic what's been done with centralized self exclusions and do the same thing with a limit system that again uses technology to protect player data to protect the operator's data, uh, but but to start to to provide standardized data to engines for example um, that might be able to predict when somebody uh, is having an issue um, data that that could be used by uh, organizations like GameCare to understand uh, and then to identify individuals um, that, that could end up being problem gamblers before they actually become uh, such an individual. So um, I, I think, as Haley put it, you know, we're, we're dealing with, with humans, we're not dealing with uh, technical regulatory requirements, and, and there's an opportunity for us to come together and identify um, the, the right tool sets to use to to um, protect those those individuals. I think that is such an important anchor. We're dealing with people, and this is an issue of people. Uh, Mark, when you talk about uh, having voluntary self exclusion, a common portal or a common portal for limit setting, are you seeing that within jurisdiction or across jurisdictions? Uh, it would be uh, for for very you know practical and pragmatic reasons uh, in jurisdiction. Um, yeah. You know every single jurisdiction. Uh, it, this is something that we we were very emphatic within uh, technical committee four five six uh, it, it, working with with the European Committee for Standardization that uh, in no way shape or form are we trying to usurp the the local jurisdictional uh, laws and regulations um, all we're trying to do is create a standard that could be used to um, ensure that the right authorities uh, the right organizations uh, have access to data that is actionable 
as opposed to a bunch of data that might be different and you know um, lead potentially to incorrect conclusions. Again, uh, going back to what Haley and, and Vasily said, you know, understanding what data and making sure that the data is the right data is critically important. Thank you. Uh, Vasiliki, I'm conscious of the time and I just want to give you a chance to weigh in on this last question uh, before we see if there's any questions from the audience. Uh, thank you, Trudy. I couldn't agree more with um, uh, uh, Haley and uh, Mark. Um, maybe I would just like to add that um, there is really uh, an importance in um, uh, in getting work done. There is. It's really important to be proactive and um, uh, see our opportunities out there. I mean, as a sector. Uh, instead of uh, waiting uh, for another uh, regulatory demand or another um, uh, law, uh, uh, we should be uh, proactive. We, we should set the limits higher ourselves um, because this is going to happen anyway. Um, I'm, I'm aware that uh, there are a lot of national um, jurisdictions that are looking into obliging uh, betting companies to use uh, technology in order to protect players. Um, so it's very important that we um, uh, get involved and we stay uh, 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 united. And uh, again, uh, I cannot underline uh, much that uh, ultimately this is for the player. Um, there, it, there should be, uh, uh, in, a, in, a, in a world of fragmentation, there should be a high level of protection for the vulnerable ones. Thank you, Vasiliki. That's a wonderful place to end our panel. I'm looking in the chat bar and I don't see any questions from the audience. Uh, so what I'd like to do is thank the three of you for your insightful discussion. Uh, I encourage participants to explore our panel participants' websites and I'm sure they would all be very willing to continue the conversation if you'd like to reach out to them directly. So thank you so much for participating today. And I'll turn the mic back to the chair. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for moderating this panel discussion. And yes, to all the viewers who are watching us now online, uh, feel free to continue sharing your questions and we will forward them on to our speakers and uh, the members of each panel uh, at the end of the conference. We move on now uh, to our next panel, panel discussion on sustainable gambling. Dr. Uh, Jörg Hoffmann will moderate the operator's panel discussion on sustainable gambling. The gambling industry, just like other sectors of the economy around the globe, is moving towards more sustainable and socially responsible practices. How do operators apply sustainable strategies for their businesses, and what does the future hold for the gambling industry? Dr. Hoffmann, the floor is yours. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, yes, that's a very interesting topic. And, and I like the previous discussion on safer gambling standards as well, because it has a certain logic now to see how the industry is applying and discussing these standards. Perhaps the industry is the most important of all stakeholders when it comes to player protection, because that is where it takes place. It can only be successful as far as it is applied. Of course, regulatory requirements also play an important role. But the industry, operators as well as suppliers, determines the technological developments and maintains a direct relationship with players. I'm very pleased to welcome some very highly experienced experts from leading international companies of the gaming industry. Let me introduce them to you. First, I'd like to welcome Ms. Iris Denbur, she serves as the group responsible manager at Kaizen Gaming, with those famous brands like Tichiman Betano. This company operates in seven different countries. It's uh, Greece, Cyprus, Germany, Romania, Portugal, Brazil, and, and Chile. Quite an impressive scope, of course. And by way of information, Iris completed studies as a social cultural worker and started her career in iGaming in 2014. 
Next to Ian is we are happy to welcome Frances Adams from Bet365, where she serves as responsible gambling support manager. Bet365, known as the world leading sports betting operator, Fran oversees the day to day operation of the responsible gambling support department and the licensed countries that fall under that, including, of course, Cyprus. And next to her, we welcome Charmaine Hogan. Charmaine serves as head of regulatory affairs with leading gaming software supplier Playtech based in the UK. She's also responsible for the policy and strategic development of that company on the gambling and gaming sector. I'd like to start with my first question, raise it to Iris Denbrough. Um, what's the approach of your, your company has adopted towards player protection and its, in its policies? And do you feel that that approach contributes towards the importance and relevance with which the player protection is perceived by society? You're on mute, I guess. If you please activate your microphone. Are still on mute? Is this working? No, it's working. Welcome back. Okay, great. Thank you for having me, uh, Dr. Hoffman. Um, and thank you for the for the kind introduction. So, with regards to your um, question around uh, player protection and uh, the way that we're perceived by uh, society and the relevance and our contribution, uh, I would say that uh, responsible gaming is uh, considered to have a great importance, of course, at Kaizen Gaming. And we always, um, of course, strive to proceed uh, to pers to. Uh, to exceed expectations of, uh, of responsible gambling standards. Um, so the way that we're adopting uh, this makes, of course, a difference for the industry. Uh, so we approach responsible gaming in uh, such a manner at Kaizen Gaming that we use a combination of our uh, great um, in-house built AI system, which we uh, use for early risk detection. And we have a very well-trained responsible gambling uh, uh, team of ambassadors, and they're very hands-on. So they're uh, sensitively attuned to understanding the customer concerns, so in verbal and written communications. Uh, and we always seek to acknowledge the risks, of course, that are involved with uh, gambling uh, when practiced irresponsibly, for example. So we educate our customers in a very holistic manner. And uh, we think it's very important to uh, highlight, of course, the risks that are involved and to be transparent to our customers about that. Um, so in our procedures, we really promote our safer play tools very proactively to our customers and we guide them, uh, of course, in the process to play uh, in a safe manner. So let's say in conclusion to your question, um, our advice is not a one size fits all approach. We believe that our um, extensive, extensive efforts in the form of, let's say, phone calls or very personal interactions with our customers uh, done by our RG ambassadors. Um, they make a difference from an ethical perspective, but um, also in a we're also being really progressive by means of uh, our open and honest and transparent communication with the customer and acknowledging uh, the risks involved uh, and hands-on advice. Um, so we're establishing a, a safer play environment uh, in that manner, and we prove our dedication to this uh, safer play promise, of course, by carrying our safe and fair accreditation seal, which we awarded for each of our jurisdictions. Um, so yeah, we uh, we believe uh, that uh, it makes a, it makes a big difference, and we we do try to go above and beyond uh, to uh, to provide the best RG assistance that's uh, that that's possible. It sounds like uh, you're applying a very advanced technology. Speaking about your own built AI system, which is impressive, I guess. AI is an important topic in this conference again. It's got some attention. So um, I guess one of these benefits is the early risk detection, which you can provide using that system. How important do you consider that benefit? It's, uh, it's very important uh, to use an early AI detection, it's much more successful to have a very early mitigation moment uh, in the customer journey. So in the moment that uh, we detect a risk, uh, for example, in a change of behavior from a customer, we're very quickly able to point that out to the customer. But at the same time, we also will have um, an indication our responsible gaming team will have an indication of the customer's uh, possible 
uh, early risk. So in that case, they can assist the customer, but they can also monitor his journey with us and they can monitor to see uh, whether uh, the intervention was proven effective or we need to, for example, use a stepped up approach. Um, so it's, it's highly effective for us. Do you have any um, feedback from your customers on how far they appreciate that new technology? Uh, we do. We do get feedback from our customers. Uh, quite often we get feedback where our customers let us know that they're surprised uh, about the way that we go above and beyond. We really proactively approach our customers and contact them. We reach out uh, based, of course, on uh, AI, um, uh, AI flags, but also based on uh, any indication uh, that they may uh, show to our customer support team. So it's really the holistic approach that uh, makes for uh, the best practice for us. Thank you for sharing these insights with us. This is a very, very interesting approach for us to be monitored. Uh, let's move to, to Francis Allen and Fran. Um, player protection, of course, that's a very, very common topic in safer gambling conferences and discussions like ours. What's the industry currently doing in this regard? Can you give us an overview from the perspective of Bet365 or your, let's say, cross-border experience? Sure. Uh, good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, depending on where everybody is. Um, yes, you're right. I think player protection forms a large part of safer gambling discussions. I think the industry in itself is unanimously in agreement that you know player protection is is a, a fundamental part of ensuring that customers are able to bet safely and responsibly and it's on the industry to ensure that those environments are created for customers to do so so i think when it comes to player protection specifically i think the industry is quite aligned with a a, a tiered approach so where you know it's tailored to varying levels of risk. So you have those customers who are, you know, betting and want to do so responsibly and safely and, and do so for a leisure activity. And then you also have those players who potentially are slightly more at risk or at risk of, of becoming affected by, by gambling related harm. So that tiered approach, what I mean by that is, you know, the industry has ways of educating customers. I think Iris touched on it previously. You know, customers should be given all the information about how to gamble responsibly and safely so that they can make their own informed, educated decisions about how to manage that themselves moving forward. Obviously, there are customers where they struggle a little bit more to identify that they are at risk of, of, of potential gambling harm. And so therefore the industry needs to be a little bit more proactive in that sense. So that's where proactive protection, play, uh, player protection measures come into play. So whether that's on-site messages or actual interactions or even going as far as account limits or account restrictions. So there's a, there's a wide spectrum that the industry Kind of cover when it comes to player protection i think you know what's also on the horizon obviously there's been development with progress for national self-exclusion register um obviously you know iris has touched on artificial intelligence you know there are there are ways that the industry is constantly evolving and trying to ensure that customers continuously have a safe environment to gamble in I mean, other than regulators who basically concentrate on the regulation in their own jurisdiction, um, a multi-international global operator such as Bet365 operates in so many various jurisdictions. Uh, do you have sort of a two-tier system that you split uh, your measures and tools maybe as a standard solution and then uh, customize to these various jurisdictions? Or how does it work? Yeah, I think there there is a a broad uh, approach to player protection measures and, and safer gambling across the whole industry, regardless of jurisdictions. I think everybody is on the same page that they want their customers to gamble responsibly and, and safely. And in order to do that, obviously there are there are blanket measures that that, that obviously applied in in all sorts of jurisdictions. So. Yes, I think it's a it's it's something that is across the board, not just for 
for Bet365, but I'm sure for the industry as a whole. Thank you very much. We'll get back to you later, but now move to Charmaine, Charmaine Hogan, because uh, we, we just discussed a few technical aspects. And uh, I know that Playtech is uh, at the forefront of developing things and applying new technologies. And looking at the technical part of responsible gaming, you know, how far uh, will enable technologies and solutions us to be more tailored in protecting players from your point of view? Uh, thank you, Jorg, and uh, good afternoon uh, to, to everyone but one from the UK. Um, actually, listening to, uh, to the previous two, uh, two panelists and also to the previous uh, panel, there's quite a recurring use of words, if you like. No? We use sustainability research, evidence-based policy, um, proactive action, gambling, uh, the gambling industry being a bit more united in how we approach these things. And I think the trick and the, and, and, and the, the, the the crux of it is that these don't become just buzzwords, that we need to tangibly show that we're doing things and efforts to raise uh, raise industry standards regardless of the market, and not simply, I dare say, because regulations in the market are tightening. And I think technology allows us to do just that. And we see a lot of focus on the, on the player, and rightly so. But of course, there are three key elements. You're talking about the player, you're talking about the product, you're talking about the place. And all of those can drive, uh, can drive risky play, can, can lead to a rise in, in problem gambling. On products, perhaps there's less that's being done. And we feel that more research and a deeper understanding is needed on those product-related uh, risks. But at the end of it, uh, we're talking about what is the aim. We're doing it, as we've all said, and we agree that gambling needs to remain a source of entertainment, but a better recognition that for some, it can become risk. And you need to be able to protect all types of players. Undoubtedly, no individual is the same, which is where the element of AI and technology kicks in, because it allows you to go down to the individual players. Um, and what it does allow you to do is look at customized solutions at better and more tailored solutions, as we've heard before, beyond that one size uh, fits all. And whereas previously there was a lot of focus on age verification, self-exclusion, and targeting the players to, if need be, you reference them to a serve um, to health treatments. Nowadays, we can use behavioral insights, and we can also use more customer interaction. And essentially what that is, is you're looking at the customer and you're helping them to make, you're guiding them to make that choice before that becomes, before the player behavior becomes problematic or leads to problem gambling. And that is what we're using and um, what we're doing at Playtech, using data and technology, investing in that to develop solutions, ultimately to support operators. So you can give the technology, but the uptake is at the end of the day to, to the operators. And key to that also is, of course, the inherent conflict of interest that we're talking about. And that is why sometimes you say, can we as an industry do it alone? Or are we going to need a regulatory push to guide us to the right direction because of that conflict of interest? And undoubtedly, some of some in the industry have made bold uh, bold decisions and where they want to want to stand either in setting themselves quite low loss limit, for example, or saying, you know, we don't want to see any problem gamblers within uh, within our company over the next X amount of years. Those are quite bold, bold commitments. But essentially what we're saying is you're taking the focus with, with, with the use of AI and machine learning on the early detection of risky play and on the explainability part. And I think this is quite important, the, the explainability part, because yes, there's data. Yes, as an industry operator, suppliers, we have data in hand, but it's how you're gathering that data and how you can then use that to explain and to trigger the, the player profiles and what do you do, what do you then? So the emphasis on the targeted and personalized approach, but also on the outcomes, on the tangible results of that. Um, I can go more into um, detail of what indicators we're talking about now or later on. Oh, well, you can continue if you like, because uh, that was a, a very broad overview and uh, it provides a lot of information. If you want to provide some details, we're happy to yes. take the time. Definitely. So essentially what we're talking about is, yes, there's data and we want to make the data more, more relevant. As I said, it's not just about tracking player behavior. It's about going into in-depth knowledge of the individual players, their activity, 
and their habits and how you analyze that data to be able to intervene early on. So essentially you're talking about various and behavioral markers. You're talking, for example, about deposits, about withdrawals, about how much, how often, about the number of declined deposits. And that research will tell you is quite an important indicator when you're looking at declined deposits. You're looking at how long a player has been playing, when, what games, whether it's large deposits, whether it's payment methods, even nighttime playing is a good indicator because in itself playing at night doesn't mean that you definitely have a problem or you're flagging risky behavior because you might be a shift worker. But if you are a player who's playing later and later on at night and um, like you're on a roll, if you like, that would be a marker. And especially if you're looking at it alongside other markers. If you look at payment methods, one payment method in its own is nothing. It's not unusual for a player to have more than one payment method, of course, but if you suddenly are seeing multiple payment methods, those could be a sign of risk at play. And especially if you look at that indicator alongside a number of increased, uh, an increased uh, losses. So those are the individual markers you're looking at or the number of deposit increase over say a 90 day period, for instance, because of course research will tell you that a problem gambler needs to increase their wages because they're constantly needing to achieve that level of excitement. So that again, you're analyzing that type of, of behavior. And then you're then looking at being able to intervene depending on that player profile early on based on their risk. And you're trying to do it in a non-judgmental way. You're doing it in place, you're doing it in real time. And that message can be very that person. It's not a standard RG message. And why we feel this is important because we have carried out some, some research and research has shown us that, for example, real time messaging, we have based on what we've uh, carried out, 20% or so um, of uh, real-time messaging is more effective than a generic um, responsible gambling email campaign, for example. And we also found that we have about 15% of players, when they receive a message during play suggesting that perhaps their type of player which should set themselves a deposit limit, 15% of those have set a limit within one hour of getting that message. So we feel that, you know, the, the kind of tangible results you want to see. But again, I go back to saying um, it should be industry in ourselves taking on those efforts quite proactively and not because we see restrictions in a few markets kicking in for whatever reasons those restrictions kicked in. So that would be where we would come for to use AI and use machine learning so that it allows you to have more adequate player protection measure beyond the generic approach and for you to intervene accordingly to each and every player, again, not generic, and you intervene at the point of time that is that is needed. And I think that's quite crucial. Very much. It looks like um, detecting those indicators for problem gambling in the past, in the old days, was mostly done by uh, human intervention. Now it's getting more and more automated by advanced systems. And we talked about AI and, and whatever you suggested. I think we've got these different stakeholders applying this technology on the operator side and probably in communication with the regulator. But I think there's another component which might be very important and we should also consider this. It's the player himself who needs to be educated, who needs to be slowly controlled and guided. I think that's a question for Ines, uh, Ines Den Boer. Um, yes. Because when I, when I learned from you introducing systems, um, do you think there's an increased urgency for the operators to educate the customers on player protection from an early moment in their online journey? I uh, thank you for this question. I, I do. Um, so as you mentioned, uh, of course, um, AI detection very important to understand the risk. Uh, but I think that dialogue is very important uh, because, of course, we can see the statistics and we can see uh, the customers being flagged in AI for a certain risk level uh, according to the triggers that were just uh, mentioned. Um, but, of course, it's very important to understand what this means to the customer because, uh, as I said, our approach is not one size fits all. So it's very important uh, what the customer's story is, as, for example, an the example that was given in the previous uh, talk was mentioned that a customer could play at night, but it doesn't necessarily mean that he's losing sleep over gambling. 
Um, so it's very important what the customer's uh, explanation is for the way that he plays. And it's, it's in the same time for us uh, when it's a moment to get to know our customer and his pattern and his motivation for playing in the way that he does. It's an opportunity for us to uh, encourage the customer to play responsibly and to educate him about responsible gaming um, tools that we offer or ways to play safely. Um, so there's definitely um, an increased importance to uh, to educate the, the customer. I think that the more that, uh, you know, this sector grows, the more transparency becomes uh, relevant and, uh, and, uh, and to be in dialogue with the customer. So of course we're flagging them and we're seeing uh, risks as early as possible. Uh, but we don't tie any um, conclusions to that. It's just an indication for us to reach out to the customer to see if any assistance is required and to see if they are aware on ways to play responsibly and to also for us personalize that uh, message to uh, see that we can fit the right tools or the right methods to the customer in a way that he benefits from it or uh, in a way that is most effective for the custom for this customer per se. Uh, so yeah, not one size fits all, and they're definitely uh, relevant. Uh, can you give me some examples of these communication communication channels with the customer? <laughs> so receiving emails, receiving phone calls, banners popping up, or how can I understand customer service works at this end? Right. So, uh, yeah, we do uh, choose different uh, kinds of communications to our customers, depending on risk levels. But uh, one of our main uh, communication channels is phone. Uh, we use phone calls for a very personalized advice or consultation to a customer. So if risk level is on the low side, we may choose to uh, nudge them to play more responsibly by uh, informing them by an email or a message. Uh, about ways to uh, play responsibly, but if, our, uh, if we have an indication that more of an intervention is required or a stepped-up approach, we definitely choose to, uh, to reach out to the customer and give them an opportunity to engage in conversation with us, uh, in dialogue, and to, uh, for us to ask them a few questions that also may spark uh, a little bit of, um, of a questioning on the customer's side, where he will question uh, his own behavior where maybe he wasn't aware initially that there may be an indication of a development of, uh, of a loss of control or a risk indication. Uh, so it's also about awareness, not just informing the customer, but making them aware about their own pattern, their own patterns, their own behaviors. Um, so it is, uh, it's definitely uh, the phone calls that we uh, apply a lot that we feel are very effective because the customer also has the opportunity to, uh, to ask us more questions and together to, for us to find out together with the customer which uh, responsible gaming tools may be efficient for this customer. So it could be that the customer is more concerned about the amount of time that he spends gambling uh, rather than uh, the money that he spends, but it could also be the other way around. So we, uh, we try to uh, match the customer with the right responsible gaming tools because uh, the effectiveness, of course, is highly important and not just the sake of having the talk with the customer, but we really aim to give the customer the advice um, that, is, that is beneficial for, for, for the customer to play in a sustainable manner and to continue in such a way with us. Right. In the previous discussion today with regulators, I learned that it's, it's very important to consult the experts. You need to educate your responsible gaming officers, your customer service, first of all, to detect some indicators, but also to apply the right sort of communication when you approach your players. Uh, do you have any ideas or any, any, any advice which you can share with us regarding consultation of experts in this regard? Um, yeah, I mean the the consultation um, of experts. It, it could be it could be uh, a wide array of uh, of experts that you see consultation with. For example, we have uh, someone with lived experience who visits us often, who gives us very uh, useful information because it's. Uh, it is um, his own lived experience. So we, we get to hear um, the indicators from someone who has lived this, who has experienced this, and who is able to tell us uh, what it looks like from the customer point of view, or at least, um, well, he was, of course, not our customer, but from a lived experience point of view. So for us, it's very 
uh, good to train our customer support with real life examples and not just uh, give them statistics or theories, but we try to really make it tangible and we try to make them really, uh, we give them the opportunity to really ask the ask experts or people with lived experience uh, what, what really goes on uh, behind developing an addiction and what is the uh, earliest, for example, moments that this person may understand that there may be an issue at play and how to best approach that and how to best use uh, communication for that. So uh, this is uh, one uh, method that we use a lot. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Fran, getting back to you, as promised, um, in your view, what are some of the most effective ways that an operator can ensure that players are protected? in practice? What would you think? What would you suggest? What would you advise? Well, I think um, it's been touched on a little bit, both by Charmaine and Iris. I think what you uh, what you have as some effective ways of interacting are, you know, many operators will have their own built-in systems, their own algorithms that, that you are, are used as ways to detect potential early risk in customer behavior. Um, so, you know, we we absolutely yeah. use that ourselves as well. And customers are presented with a range of either messages or interactions from from us to determine um, for for them basically to get awareness of of their own gambling behaviour. Now, those have proved to be to be very effective. And I think when you go to the more proactive player protection measures, where you get into, like Iris was saying the actual verbal conversations with customers. So that a customer has been flagged to you for some reason, either demonstrating uh, certain behavior or even they themselves have come to you and said, you know, look, I, you know, I think I may potentially have a problem with my gambling. I think some of the most effective uh, player protection measures or, or ways that, that we can protect our players are those verbal interactions. You, you, get a wealth of information from the customer themselves when you just open up a dialogue with them and, and have an in-depth conversation about about you know their gambling behavior their patterns what their thoughts are on their own behavior um, and so some of those are definitely the the most effective I think that you're still on mute. That's why we can't hear you. Are you? Oh, sorry. No, I can. No, we could. We we could hear you, uh, but it it went silent for a minute, and um, I don't know who's trying to talk at this moment in time. But whoever it is, because I can't really see down there, whoever it is, um, you're on mute. I think it's Rachel. Can you unmute your microphone? Um, I think it, I think it, can you hear me? Yes, now we can hear you. Okay, I'm, I'm just signing in. I, I'm sorry to uh, have interrupted. Uh huh. Okay, so I think that our moderator has uh, disconnected, um, and we don't have him uh, uh, with us. Um, but um, up next is um, Francis Adams. You did. You you were just finishing off correctly. I did not interrupt you, did I? No, no, no. I, I'd, I'd said my, I'd said my piece. I think, um, I think Jörg is having some, some difficulties. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it, uh, if we should um, wait for him to be connected again, or shall we move on to Iris Denboer? Uh, thank you. Um, so yeah, I think that Jörg is trying to, uh, to reconnect. 
Uh, he will dive yes. in again, is from what I understood. Um, so yeah, until he returns. Um, uh, yeah, I think that the last uh, thing that we discussed, uh, and also in the previous uh, talk, that um, that the dialogue is important with the customer, yeah. understanding um, the customer's uh, needs, and uh, discussing this uh, together. So not assigning the customer or um, uh, let's say assigning the customer to use a certain tool, but instead uh, to, to decide together with the customer or encourage the customer to make his own informed decisions based on providing him the correct information. Uh, so this is something that's uh, still very relevant for us and uh, something that we really endorse in our, uh, in our communications to the customer. Um, so yeah, I think that uh, Dr. Hoffman will be maybe with us shortly again. Um, would you like uh, Charmaine Hogan, uh, Head of Regulatory Affairs at Playtech, would you like uh, to say something on the topic before uh, we manage to get Dr. Hoffman back online with us? Yes, uh, certainly. I think we're all on the same page in talking about where we see us as an industry moving and where individual operators and suppliers are placing their, their efforts. We're talking essentially about looking at the players, an individual player. We're all talking about how we're stepping up and how we need to step up our focus in individual players in marking the, the, the behavior so that throughout the customer journey, you can intervene at the right and at appropriate moment. I suppose where I'm coming from, I'm saying we're looking at using um, which is basically Bad Buddy, uh, which is Playtech um, software system. And we're saying, listen, look at that data, analyze that data, look at what those indicators are flagging, and that whatever time those indicators are flagging at risk behavior, you can intervene in real time through in-play messaging, for example, addressing the player individually. Whether that player has spent too much time playing or at the risk of seeing its time played um, increasing. You're looking at the types of games and the fluctuation across games. You're looking at erratic behavior and what they're doing. You're looking at the fluctuations of their behavior, looking at loss chasing. All those are types of elements that you say like, okay, this is how I need to interact during play with, with the player. And it could be, as I said, you know, whether it's money, whether it's time, and you're trying to be not judgmental because that could make, perhaps scare a player off. And you're trying to to get them there, listen, you've, be, you've spent X amount of time so far online. Players like you usually take a coffee break, for example. So simple, straightforward messaging, which uh, is uh, giving that information, that awareness to the player that, okay, maybe I do need to, to take a break, for instance, at this particular point in time. Um, I don't know if you are disconnected or not, actually. Okay, thank you. But no, I'm still here. <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're okay. trying to get we're, we're trying to get Dr. Hoffman back online with us. Um, I think that um, if we uh, don't, is he back online with us? Yes, he is back online with us. Technology can be a great yes. thing, but sometimes it desperately <laughs> fails you horribly. Um, Dr. Hoffman, I'm so sorry. Glad yeah. to have you back with us. So you can hear me again and see me again. It's a pleasure. Thank you. Yes, yes, we can see yes. you and hear you. Right. Thanks. I think there is there is one point uh, which I would like to raise, and that is the communication, which is important. Communication among the stakeholders. So we have the suppliers and the operators. Of course, they work together. And on the other side, there's regulators representing regulation and legislation. And since technology is always ahead, I think it's most important that the stakeholders talk to each other. Are there any best practices in your experience you'd like to share with us? And I think, Charmaine, you raised this point earlier. If you can stick to it again just a little bit, and we probably hear what the others say as well for the remaining time. Yes, definitely. Um, I think we're talking about communication. We're talking about collaboration. And as I see it, it's, of course, collaboration. It's, I think it's the same. Pardon? I think it's... it's almost the same you need if you uh, collaborate you certainly need to communicate i think uh, we've definitely. got the same understand definitely and that is between operators and suppliers so between and within the industry but also you have to go beyond that we're looking at in our view key stakeholders and those key stakeholders are your academia your researchers 
public health bodies and certainly regulatory authorities. And I think we need to come more and more round, round the table together. If I take a very small practical example, for instance, in Spain, the, the regulator has this advisory council. So even when discussing an upcoming degree and, decree and its implementation, you have different key stakeholders around the table. And of course, then the key point there is that the, the dis discussion there is constructive and what the regulator can tangibly take away from that and actually is, is listening, of course. And um, in the UK, we've seen, for example, how the industry can come together and relatively quickly, if you like, perhaps a bit pushed by the regulator, but the trade association in the UK drew up a code of conduct on game design features, for instance, which the regulator is now going to take up and it will be required um, to be implemented by the end of, end of the month. You know, Yes, granted, it was a push or a challenge to the industry, but the industry came together and came up with a code. And I think those are really clear, clear, um, clear examples. I think we all talk about placing sustainability at the core of our business, but what is that? I think it's also a cultural change within the industry, within each, each and every one of our businesses, that you bring different arms of the business closer together. You have regulatory, you have compliance, you have commercial, we all need to work closer together. We talk about raising awareness and educating the player externally, but internally, we also need to, do, to, need to make each other more aware of what it is we're doing and why. And I touched upon proactively earlier, because I think we don't want these keywords to become purely buzzwords. And we want to be, as an industry, raising standards much more proactively, not because in, um, let's say, Sweden, you have restrictions kicking in, so, oh, we have to do something. I think we, we have all the tools and all the energy and experts out there available it's about putting them together and saying, listen, let's move forward. And what we would like to see is also much more peer-reviewed research carried out and not using research, again, just as a buzzword to say, oh, we like the evidence, peer-reviewed research, so that you can have better evidence-based policy. And what we also would like to call for more and more is the sharing of, of those findings when you've carried out research. Perhaps they're not always the findings or the conclusions we like, but we're going to have to be more honest and transparent out there if we want to see more, take a more long-term view in the industry. So, that research, sharing that research and talking and engaging in the debates in a wider um, plethora of, uh, of stakeholders, in my view. It's a good view. It's important to, to share know-how and experience. So my experience shows that it's a very good uh, opportunity if regulators and representatives of the industry or gaming lawyers attend the same conferences and to share the same panels, discussions and meet up afterwards. Uh, Fran, from your perspective, so many jurisdictions, so many different regulators. Is there anything you suggest could be improved? I guess they're not all the same. I think that um, what Charmaine has just mentioned really about that collaboration and that, that collectiveness, I think that raising standards together as an industry is absolutely more effective than than individual operators trying to trying to do that themselves so when the industry does come together and they are you know aligned with with their views and what what should be done in order to to better protect players then then that absolutely is more effective but i think the point that that Charmaine made obviously about collaborating with with research and you know public health bodies and, and evidence i think that's also important and as she touched on specifically with the intention of evidence-led policy and i think that that really is a that really is a key thing and i think with that with collaboration of the industry as a whole then i think we will be creating a much you know a, a, a much more an environment for customers to play in industry-wide that that is continuously protecting our players. Thank you. And finally, let's see Kaizen's view from Iris Limbo. Do you do you share this uh, experience? Would you like to add something from your own perspective? Uh, I agree with uh, what was said. Uh, it uh, it would definitely contribute. I think that uh, the industry has matured a lot. Uh, you know, and uh, Kaizen Gaming, of course, uh, we uh, we support this, and uh, I think that uh, coming from a place of uh, integrity and uh, building on sustainability, I think that uh, it's uh, it's always important for uh, 
for for us to uh, to to uh, to collaborate and to uh, to work closely together and uh, to try to uh, of course get responsible gaming to be uh, adopted in uh, in uh, in the most uh, practical and successful way. Um, so uh, we definitely uh, support that. Well, that's a wonderful closing word, I would say. I can't see any questions so far. If there is one, uh, please send them to me now, and we're happy to answer them. Um, at the moment, it does not look so. And this gives me the opportunity first to apologize again for being disconnected. That's the difference to an in-person conference. That would never happen. So looking forward to doing this again, probably in one year's time, in person, upfront, in Nicosia, or wherever you want to, to conduct Pokemon World Session. Secondly, my thanks to my contributors, to my panelists for an excellent discussion, even partly without a moderator. You've done great. And finally, thank you very much to the organizers for hosting this wonderful event for the first time now. Uh, I'm happy to follow the other coming panel sessions and presentations. And all of you have a good time. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoffman. Thank you. And yes, hopefully you will be able to join us in Nicosia um, post-COVID. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Let me now introduce Dr. Sharon Collard, who is our next speaker for today's conference. Dr. Sharon is Research Director at the University of Bristol in the UK. Do financial services have a role in helping reduce harms from gambling? This presentation will explore the potential role of financial services in helping reduce harms from gambling, drawing on research conducted in Britain with the financial services sector and people who have experience of gambling and gambling harms. Dr. Collard, the digital floor is yours. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. So I, um, as, as has already been introduced, I'm going to talk about the role of financial services in helping reduce the harms from gambling. So, so to start straight away by saying um, that clearly financial services may have a role to play, um, but there are many other actors involved as well, most importantly, gambling operators and regulators. So we are definitely not saying that um, financial services um, uh, it, it's acting um, uh, in a way that's contrary to other actors, what we're seeing, what we're saying is that can financial services um, help reduce gambling harms in a way that is complementary to the primary work that is carried out by gambling operators and gambling regulators. So this is based on um, research that was done, that we have done in Britain, um, that was published last year. Um, and I'm going to focus today on the work that we've done around um, gambling blocks that financial services can offer their customers in order to help them control their gambling spend. First of all, I just wanted to think about five reasons why financial services um, have a role to play in helping reduce the gambling harm, and in particular, the financial harm from gambling. Firstly, they have significant reach into our population. So almost all UK adults have a debit card and many of us are connected to the financial services sector in other ways as well. That means that financial services firms and particularly banks have a unique window into our financial situations that can help them to see where there may be risk of gambling harm uh, and potentially to intervene to help prevent that. Thirdly, uh, linked to that, financial services firms can offer tools to help customers manage their gambling spend. Um, and fourthly, in the UK, there has been a much stronger regulatory focus on the fair treatment of vulnerable customers in the past five years or so. And that includes customers who might be at risk of gambling related vulnerability. And indeed, some of our more recent work has looked at that. And finally, I think there's a business case for financial services to have a role. In 2016, 2017, there was um, around three and a half, uh, sorry, 350 million pounds of reported fraud was linked uh, to gambling. Um, gambling related con misconduct is potentially an issue among financial services employees. But 
but also there's demand, I think, from customers as um, firms offer things like gambling blocks, customers uh, expect financial services firms to be doing more to stop financial related harm happening from gambling. So at the moment, we have 10 UK firms that offer debit card gambling blocks. And these are essentially a feature um, within an app or a mobile banking um, uh, app, uh, mobile banking functionality, um, which enables the customer to um, voluntarily put on a, a, a spending block. And once they've activated that spending block, what it means is that they will not be able to use that particular card um, to, to pay for gambling. Most of them, as, as I say, are app-based app or mobile phone-based, um, but, th but there are also opportunities for people to switch on um, uh, gambling blocks with some firms, for example, um, to, do, to be able to do that within the branch. So the research that we've done around this is, is looking really at what makes for an effective um, card control. Uh, when we started this work back in 2019, there was very little evidence about what worked in terms of bank card gambling blocks and who, was, who, who they might work for. So what we have done is used um, uh, new research to produce a blueprint for card controls, where we're really aiming to balance commercial realism for banks and other financial services firms with consumer-centered friction and intervention. And the research that we've done, we have carried out is based on insights from people with lived experience through surveys and interviews. We've also um, analyzed aggregated data and statistical insights that was provided by banks um, and other firms on customer use of gambling blocks. And we've had discussions with treatment providers, um, financial services firms, and regulatory bodies. And so it is an evidence-based blueprint that we have produced. Just to give a kind of summary of our findings, there were five main things that we felt were important, um, which I'll talk through briefly um, in the rest of my presentation. The first one was around availability and the fact that actually we think that because the technology works on bank card gambling blocks, they should be available to all card users. The blocks do seem to work in terms of their technical effectiveness. They seem to block almost all gambling transactions, although there were some examples of something called transaction laundering, which is where um, it's not possible to track the trans traction, transaction back to a gambling operator. But those were quite, um, um, quite unusual at the time when we did the research. In terms of their technical effectiveness, the blockers did seem to be helpful in controlling uh, people's gambling spend and helping people to stop gambling. Um, for example, we, we conducted an online survey with people who've been in touch with gambling treatment and support services, and 30% of those respondents had activated a card blocker, and over half of those uh, respondents who had activated a card blocker had since spent less or no money at all on gambling. And similarly, data from a bank that, that engaged in the research suggested that um, block users um, ha ha had turned on the block um, and, and not gambled subsequently, which is very positive. And so what we would like to see is um, bank cards uh, blocks as a standard feature, because when we were doing the research, as many as 28 million personal current accounts and 35 million credit cards may not have offered blocks. And that was a lot of potential um, help and support that wasn't available to those customers. So once um, firms are um, making blocks available as standard, the other thing that's really important is around raising awareness about those blocks. Um, we found in our survey that only, um, you know, awareness was quite low. Nearly half of our survey participants were not aware of them, and that was a group of people who would have benefited from them. We felt that edu um, gambling education, treatment and peer support services have a really important role to play in raising consumer awareness alongside other tools um, uh, and, and help that might be available. 
And the information about the um, bank card blocks needs to be easy to understand and transparent in terms of, you know, if somebody uses a bank card block, how is the data that's generated from that going to be used by the bank um, and providing some reassurance um, about that. So the third um, thing that was really important that we found from our research is about the design of the blocks themselves. And what we would suggest from the findings that, we, um, that we've um, uh, published is that every debit card blocker should be built around a time release lock. And so what does that mean in practice? Well, at the time of the research, over a third of the bank card blockers that were in existence could be literally toggled on and off like a light switch. So if somebody, a customer, um, wanted to put the block on, they could do so, but they could just as easily switch it off. Um, and now what we've seen is that evolve over time. So nearly, um, so nine of the 10 firms that have blocks actually have a time release block, um, a time release lock in place. So what that means in practice is that if somebody has put um, a gambling block on their debit card and they decide to take it off, they can take it off, but they will have to wait for a period of time, normally between 48 and 72 hours. So it basically gives a cooling off period in which they can um, think about um, whether they actually want to remove the block um, or if they want to, to keep it on. And it's the idea that, um, you know, in the heat of the moment, um, it gives somebody pause for thought before they turn the block off. And that's important because what um, banks were seeing in their own data analysis was potentially higher toggling, so this switching on and off, and higher gambling spend where there was no time release lock um, in place. Our research with people with lived experience also indicates the importance of choice. So nearly 60% of our survey participants thought a time release lock should be 48 hours or more. And in fact, um, nine of the 10 firms um, do have a lock of that duration now. And that has evolved a little bit over time. But also over 80% of our survey participants supported banks offering the option of a permanent block. Um, and that's not something that is available at the moment. So moving on to um, thinking about what else can reinforce the positive impact of um, debit card uh, blockers. Well, the fourth thing was around um, actually having a complementary feature, which would be to limit cash withdrawals um, and actually having that as a standard feature alongside bank card gambling blocks. Why is that important? Well, evidence from one bank that took part in our research suggested that around 15% of its gambling block users had found a workaround to their gambling block. Um, while they couldn't say for certain that that was always cash, cash did seem like an obvious um, candidate for that workaround uh, by going to an ATM, taking cash out and spending it um, on gambling. Now, it is the case at the moment that most UK banks will, if they're asked by the customer, place a monthly or a daily limit on um, the cash withdrawals that you can make from a cash machine. But we th really feel that, that actually a stronger connection needs to be made between firms, the financial services firms, between the cash limits um, and the card blockers so that the two can almost go hand in hand for people who really want to try and um, control or completely stop. Um, gambling. And it's also important in terms of helping customers to make that connection too. So it's not just about what's going on on your debit card, it's also about um, having access to cash. And the final finding really goes um, beyond um, debit cards themselves and thinking about, you know, the payments um, system is rapidly evolving. There are lots and lots of new payment methods. Um, around that can that mean that people may move away from using uh, debit cards um, to gamble and spend in other ways. And so I think it's really important that that things evolve alongside alongside the payment system. So what we've seen is what we would like to see is e-wallet providers um, offering their own gambling blocks. Now in Britain since April 2020, gambling operators um, should only take an e-wallet payment um, where it hasn't come from a credit card because gambling on credit cards has been banned. 
However, debit card deposits are still permitted, meaning they remain a possible workaround because somebody can, while somebody can't gamble directly using their debit card, they can use their debit card um, to fund an e-wallet and gamble in that way. So we felt that there was really um, a, a good opportunity here for e-wallet providers to do the same as the debit card providers and, and provide a, a block, which would be a time release block as well. Um, and that would build on changes that they already had made in response to the Gambling Commission's um, credit card ban in Britain. So it would seem like a natural evolution. And finally, there's also the role of credit reference agencies. These are um, in the UK, these are commercial agencies. We have um, a, a, a fairly significant number of them um, which, which hold and manage our credit files. And there is an opportunity there for credit reference agencies to play a, a role in terms of helping people to opt out of credit if they don't um, want to be lent to uh, because they're worried about gambling with the money. Um, and that could be by using something called a notice of correction on their personal credit record, um, which, which gives extra information about their situation, um, such as that they do not want to be lent to because um, they're worried about um, spending that money on gambling. And um, some of the credit reference agencies do have information on their websites um, about using a notice of correction where somebody is worried about their gambling. So that is um, a, a one step forward, but we feel there's much more that could be done to make it easy and straightforward for people to do that. And again, to raise awareness that that's an option for people. So that's um, a very a brief overview about the work we've been doing on bank card gambling blocks in Britain um, and a reminder of the kind of the five key things um, that we found from the research, which ultimately um, takes us beyond um, banks and, and debit cards into new forms of payment and thinking about the other actors in the financial ecosystem, such as credit reference agencies. Um, so the report is publicly available to download from our website. Um, and and um, if you have any questions, um, please do get in touch. I'd be very happy to um, take any questions um, offline, obviously. Um, yeah, and if download you from our questions. website. Um, and and um, if you have any questions, um, please do get in touch. I'd be very happy to. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Collard. Um, and yes, a reminder to everybody who's watching us at this moment in time that uh, feel free to share your questions with us and they will be forwarded to um, our speakers. Thank you. On to our fourth panel discussion on gambling disorder as a public health issue. The panel will be moderated by Christina Govna, Head Policy Change and Management Consulting in Oath Limited Cyprus. A gambling disorder is considered a public health issue. What should be the framework for introducing the concept of public health across the gambling disorder continuum? Is there a need to integrate gambling disorder in the general health services system? What is the cost effectiveness of such an approach? This panel of experts will, will discuss how a public health approach towards gambling disorder might be implemented. Thank you, Chair. Ms. Golden. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, Chair. Yes. Thank you very much to the organizers as well um, for this um, session. Uh, it is a pleasure and a sheer honor to be moderating um, our two panelists. When looking through the literature, really, to refer to their work, you are humbled by the breadth of scope and the depth of the analysis into gambling disorder. So without further ado, I will be introducing um, and starting with the ladies, uh, Professor Dr. Rachel Bolberg. Uh, she is a research professor at the School of Public Health and Health Sciences at the University of Massachusetts in Amherst in the US. She is one of the world's leading experts on the social and economic aspects of gambling and problem gambling. And she is the first researcher to receive funding from the US National Institutes of Health to study the prevalence of problem gambling in the general population. And the next is Professor Dr. Mark Griffiths, a chartered psychologist and distinguished professor of behavioral addiction at the Nottingham Trent University. 
He is also director of the International Gaming Research Unit there, and he is internationally known for his work into gambling and gaming addictions. And he has won numerous national and international prizes for his research, published an immense body of work, and we are honored to have both of them here. Um, as the chair very kindly said in her uh, introductory note, um, we listen very often to this public health approach to managing gambling disorder. Um, what I would like to ask both of our uh, panelists is, in your opinion, to make this really practical, what is your advice to a health system or to a government or to a regulator looking to introduce this public health approach into their um, gaming regulation, how, what are the defining elements? What are the building blocks? What is your figurative checklist of things they should be looking to introduce to ensure that this public health approach is gradually embedded in the gaming disorder management in a country? So, Professor Wahlberg, if you want to start. Yeah, can, can you hear me? Yes, clearly. Yeah, so um, I, th I think the, the place to start probably is to understand that uh, a public health approach is focused not on individual uh, people who have a gambling problem, but is a population focused effort. And so you have to um, look at the full continuum of gambling harms as we now talk about them and understand that it's not just individual problem gamblers or disordered gamblers who are experiencing the effects, but it's also their family members, their employers, um, and others in the community. And so what that, what that suggests is a very broad uh, strategic framework for developing uh, prevention efforts, treatment efforts, and recovery efforts um, all at the same time. So in Massachusetts, um, we have a very strong independent regulator of our casinos that were introduced um, in, in the early uh, 2010s. Um, and that regulator adopted a um, a, a uh, strategy uh, for responsible or safer gambling that lays out a number of initiatives. Um, the other uh, thing to understand about what, what we're doing in Massachusetts, which is uh, very much a public health approach, um, is that uh, when, the, um, when the legislation to legalize casinos happened here in Massachusetts, the policymakers themselves very wisely ensured that there would be a funding mechanism for all of the prevention and treatment services that would be needed. And that's a very unusual thing. Not very many jurisdictions do that. And so um, that has enabled us uh, in Massachusetts to begin um, even before the casinos were built uh, to start to measure uh, what was going on with gambling and problem gambling in Massachusetts. Uh, we were able to understand the environment in which the casinos were being introduced. Uh, we very much took a um, broad population approach, but we also were able, because of our legislation, uh, to build policy uh, and regulations uh, that um, were both funded and um, we think effective in ensuring that um, people could have access to uh, help if they wanted it um, or uh, self-help uh, materials if they wanted those because we know that that only a small percentage of people who actually experience gambling harms ever seek help so those are the the pieces that that i think of um, and that i'm working to implement here in massachusetts uh, but I'll give Mark, uh, Dr. Griffiths, a, a, an opportunity to talk. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, 
to put this into context, we are talking about a population-focused or a population-based effort that is essentially following the full continuum of gambling behavior. And then you have the funding mechanisms in place so that you can start research early on to understand the environment you will be developing this public health approach into and how best to protect not only the player, but essentially um, society as a whole with all its structures and its mechanisms. So, Professor um, Griffiths, would you agree? Would you add to that kindly? Can you hear us? Um, our speaker, maybe our speaker is still on mute. Could you unmute your microphone, please? because we can't hear you. Um, Professor Griffiths, can you hear us? No, I think uh, Professor Griffiths is, is unable to hear us or um, the microphone is... Uh, on, still on mute. Could you could you unmute your microphone? Are you there? Can you hear us? Okay. Um, Professor Griffiths has connectivity issues. So could we just continue? Um, yes, the please. Talk, yes. Uh, yes. With, thank sure, you. Chair. Thank you very yes. much. Yes. Sure. So Professor Volberg, coming back to you um, again. Um, so within this public health approach, would you say that, um, um, and, and I've read your very recent work on the conceptual framework of harmful gambling, how it's a fantastic piece of work, but would you kindly elaborate um, a bit on that as well as tell us how this could inform this public health approach um, on gambling disorders? Ah, <laughs> so that that's um, a, a direction that I did not um, expect to go, uh, but yes, the, the conceptual framework uh, uh, on, um, of, of gambling harms is uh, an international uh, um, overview of the evidence base uh, related to um, the, the provision of, of gambling services and uh, sort of, and, and how to uh, minimize and mitigate gambling harm. Um, so the the conceptual framework itself consists of four um, broad uh, areas that are not gambling related, and then four broad areas that are specific to gambling. Um, the the original effort, because the the most recent uh, framework is actually the third iteration. Uh, but the original intent of, of the framework was to uh, try to identify areas uh, where research was needed. Um, because although there is a great deal of gambling research that's been done, um, there are some rather glaring uh, holes in what we know. And um, in particular, uh, there, there are sort of um, gaps in understanding uh, you know what the what the cause what the causal relationships are so back in 2013 I believe um, the uh, the Ontario problem gambling research center brought together um, a group of uh, international researchers to uh, basically review all of the literature in these um, eight separate areas and try to identify um, areas where work was needed. Um, the second and, and now the third iteration have basically been every three years updating that conceptual framework to try to understand where evidence is being developed and where there is still a need for additional um, evidence. Uh, the framework is available on the website of um, the Ontario Problem Gambling Research Center uh, morphed into uh, the Gambling Research Exchange of Ontario, or GRIO, and the conceptual framework is posted as an interactive um, 
uh, website, I guess, uh, on on uh, GRIA's uh, larger website, and it it provides um, research summaries for people who don't want to get into the research. It provides um, you know access to the original research for people who want to go uh, to you know the 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 original sources. Um, so it's it's a very uh, um, sort of compact way to um, access the evidence that we have for the effectiveness of, of different interventions at, at all levels, you know, the, the prevention level, the treatment level, um, and then, um, you know, policy and regulation. So the reason I'm asking you is because um, the framework assists us passively as researchers or as people interested in this um, field of work to understand the complex interactions between a number of um, parameters that affect um, gambling behavior and then eventually gambling disorder for some. Um, what I wanted to ask is that um, I think it helps us understand, it sheds light on the importance of um, general health services in identifying those behaviors or screening for those behaviors first, identifying for some of the variables and care. And um, for uh, a number of healthcare systems, this is largely overlooked as an area of interest. So gambling um, dependence, addiction, disorder, um, whatever you want to call it, is being bundled into something that is either substance use disorder or uh, is nowhere to be identified, seen, managed. So how can we ensure by using by helping the general health system or regulators or governments um, see this complex modality of um, gambling disorder how can we help them understand the benefit of opening up care in general health services or what is the optimal pathway really to ensuring that um, a person that develops a gambling disorder can be effectively managed rehabilitated and to return back to gaming if and when um, as a source of pleasure rather than, you know, as a source of a problem. Yeah, uh, well, um, trying, trying, to, um, trying to integrate uh, gambling uh, services into a broader health uh, framework um, has, has been an ongoing struggle uh, as, as long as I've been in the gambling studies field, which is quite a while. Um, and as I've thought about it, I, I've concluded that um, in the same way that there is uh, quite a lot of stigma attached to, um, to admitting that a person has a gambling problem, there uh, seems to be an equal amount of stigma amongst health professionals uh, concerned or, or um, uh, around the around the um, idea of asking um, their patients or their clients about um, financial issues. So I, I think that there is a, a lot of discomfort on both sides and stigma, and that is probably um, the first big uh, barrier uh, that needs to be overcome is to try to educate health professionals and health-related uh, policymakers around the importance of building gambling um, references into uh, treatment for, um, you know, for primary care um, as much and as well as. Um, you know, substance use and um, mental health issues. So I understand that Professor Griffiths is with us now. Um, can you hear yeah, us? Yeah, I'm really sorry. Um, I don't know what happened there, but it cut out. I hope you can hear me. Absolutely, yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the session. There you are. Um, we can also see you now. Um, it okay. is an honor and a pleasure to have you. For me there. 
<laughs> with us. So what we uh, discussed with Professor Forberg is really the um, elements, the essential elements that would assist a country or a system, essentially also a healthcare system, introduce this public health approach to the gaming disorder or gambling disorder. And that would be a population-based approach to gambling, a, um, a continuum approach that covers the full of the gambling sector, and then finally um, the funding mechanisms that are in place to support research to understand the environment. Um, would you kindly add to that? I've, I've seen your very recent open letter to regulators and governments across the world to do more in this area. Would you like to elaborate on that? <clears throat> yeah, I think there's a lot of issues here. And obviously, I agree with Rachel totally about uh, population-based approach. I mean, for I mean, I've spent 34 years in the area, and I think until very recently, most, you know, whether it was regulation, whether it was research, whether it was treatment, everything was focused on the individual rather than looking at the population as a whole. So I totally agree uh, with, with Rachel's approach there. But I think first, in any, you know, when we talk about a, a public health approach, particularly on a, a population level, you've actually got to convince governments and health policy makers in the first place that gambling is actually a public health issue. I mean, here in the UK, our, our gambling legislation is overseen by the Department of Culture, Media and Sport rather than the Department of Health and Social Care. And for me, you know, that just shows that the government themselves here in the UK are not actually treating gambling as a public health issue because it's not even located in the right department. I mean, once you can actually convince government that gambling is a public health issue, and again, I know Rachel and myself, we're both passionate believers of this, and we've both written editorials for the British Medical Journal arguing that gambling is a public health issue. But, you know, if you're going to do that, then you, obviously you've got to actually show that, they, you know, you've got to actually show that, um, uh, that that it is a problem. You've got to find out, you know, how big the problem is. I mean, Rachel's obviously done prevalence survey after prevalence survey, which obviously feeds into knowing how big the problem is in the first place and develop it, you know, developing that data set so that you can actually take this forward is a, is a really important thing to do. Uh, I mean, we know that, you know, again, when people think about, problem gambling we have to realize is that for every problem gambler it, you know it affects another five to ten people around them um, and so you know when, when we come to think about what we're going to do in terms of turning um, gambling into a public health issue we have to realize is that we have to get all the stakeholders on board so it's not just about the regulators and the policymakers, but the industry have to be involved as well treatment providers researchers and obviously, we, you know, we, we as stakeholders, we've been coming together for years to discuss um, the, the gambling issue. Um, but, you know, for, you know, and again, I think in terms of the, the strategies that have gone on in the past three decades, a lot of actually, you know, a lot of it has been about just targeting those high risk individuals, those that are problem gamblers, again, without seeing the, the kind of wider um, issues. And we, you know, we need legislative or regulatory measures that are going to tackle lots of important issues like gambling availability, like gambling affordability, like gambling licensing, like gambling advertising and marketing and the price of products, et cetera. And we, you know, we need that kind of integrated um, system, including the treatment system that, you know, if you think about, you know, gambling does not happen in a vacuum. And we know that there are comorbidities between gambling addictions and other addictions, substance, you know, substance abuse disorders. And obviously there's a high comorbidity between gambling addiction and problem gambling and things like depression, anxiety, stress-related disorders. And when it comes to treatment, you know, we don't want to be reinventing the wheel and just necessarily just having dedicated services for gambling. You know, most, you know, you know within the UK uh, national health system, we have a very good system for treating drug and alcohol addictions. You know, the treatment uh, procedures and processes for treating drug and alcohol um, uh, people with, with, with those problems they are very similar to gambling and you know gambling should actually just be part of a general addiction service and i think if gambling was on that public health agenda is that gambling addiction and problem gambling could then be treated by the pathways we already have in most you know i, I would think in most um, services throughout the world you know we know that drug and alcohol problems form you know a small but significant problem in society the same is for gambling you know, the treatments are, are pretty much similar. Yes, everybody, you know, there are idiosyncrasies and we have to fit the treatments to the individual, but whether it's cognitive behavioral therapy or pharmacotherapy, group therapy, you know, individual counselors, these are all things that we find in integrated um, national health systems throughout, throughout the world and gambling should, should be part of that.
Um, would you say, and then the, the same question goes out to Professor Wolberg as well, would you say that there is an element of cost efficiency in doing this? Um, we, we've seen very, very uh, detailed work done in 1999 that said that, you know, for uh, in the U.S., that for each dollar you spend in um, treating people, in identifying and treating people with a gambling disorder, um, the system... Um, basically earns or uh, does not spend $20. So is this 20 to 1 ratio something that would um, fit in uh, your experience and your calculations? I don't know about the actual ratio, but it certainly would be cost effective to treat people with gambling problems within a system that's already treating, you know, mental health issues and other types uh, of addiction issue. You know, you know, in the UK, we only have one dedicated uh, National Health Service Treatment Centre, which obviously is doing sterling work, but obviously we've got, you know, we've got a population of 67, 68 million people, of which around half a percent of, of that population have a gambling problem. Now, we know that not everybody uh, who has a gambling problem accesses problem gambling services, and, you know, one of the problems is, is that, you know, the gambling services that we do, ha do have are not particularly well known in comparison to, to, you know, drug and alcohol services. People don't necessarily know where they can go for that type of help in the first place. You know, and we, you know, we have a very good NHS system in, in the UK, and you know, it's free at the point of demand. You know, we did, we, you know, uh, myself and Dr. Jane Rigby, we did a survey where we used the Freedom of Information Act. We, you know, we contacted every single um, NHS trust in the UK. And what we found was that only 9% of the, the NHS service that has ever treated a gambling within, you know, a, a problem gambler within their their more general addiction services. So there we've got a case that over 90% of the national health system in the UK within their addiction services had never even treated gambling there. But it would be a very cost efficient way to do it because as I say that, you know, those people who treat drug and alcohol addictions, the, the way that those people are treated, it would be exactly the same. Well, within reason, it's exactly the same way to treat uh, problem gamblers. So in that sense, it would be a very, very cost efficient way to do it. Professor Goldberg? Yes, I, I agree with um, with Professor Griffiths that um, there are definitely efficiencies that can be achieved. Um, I'm not I'm not going to go back to the numbers from 1999 because those are probably out of date and um, only relevant in the U.S. anyway. Um, but but really the the issue uh, from my perspective is uh, that. Um, a, a gambling problem rarely travels alone. Um, people with gambling problems tend to have other uh, kinds of <clears throat> issues, either with addictions or with depression or anxiety. And so the efficiency is in, um, is, is in achieving a successful uh, uh, treatment outcome means that you have to address all of the problems that any individual client or patient presents you with. Um, so I, I do think that there is a lot of work to be done um, to educate and, and to build uh, gambling treatment into uh, larger health services, uh, not just in the UK, uh, but worldwide. Um, I, I, I don't think it's it's a very common thing at all uh, here in the United States, and certainly from what Professor Griffiths has been saying, um, it's not very common in the UK either. And I think the challenge across healthcare systems is that these players, um, the, the players that develop a gambling disorder, are largely unseen. And to the extent that they are left out of the general healthcare services, despite the fact that they have comorbidities that could lead them to care and treatment earlier, um, this um, just exacerbates the problem and um, makes it extremely difficult for a healthcare system, but a society as well, to overcome the stigma that is attached to identifying and managing these uh, patients, really, these um, players. Um, so would you not say that the general healthcare services would be well equipped at least to, you know, monitor for um, gambling disorder, especially among comorbid patients, so with patients that present with some sort of mental health disorder or some sort of mental health anxiety, depression, would it be no, would it not be efficient for the general health services to also screen for um, uh, gambling disorder? 
I mean, and I, then can I just say, I mean, defined, back, in 2000, absolutely. back in 2000, sorry, back in 2007, I was asked by the British Medical Association here in the UK to look yes. at how gambling could actually be integrated within a, a, a more general um, health system. And one of the, the you know, the primary recommend, recommendations I, I talked about there is a need for just general healthcare professionals, including um, general practitioners, to actually screen their patients for gambling disorder. They routinely do it for you know their tobacco use, their drug use, their alcohol drinking, and gambling is just one of those things that's just not on the, the GP's radars um, to start with. So for me, you know, screening is absolutely you know we, we should just be doing this routinely. And again, if you look at in terms of uh, the training of medics in most countries is that gambling again is not something that is actually on the, the kind of general curricula that people do they're told about alcohol and drug problems but gambling is just not something there to start i mean when it comes to screening and obviously professor volberg will be well, well aware of this you know there are over 25 different screening instruments out there for problem gambling we're awash with ways that we can actually screen uh, for problem gamblers in the first place but they're, they you know these instruments are so not used within general um, healthcare settings. As I say it's only those that are, are treating gamblers in the first place that are actually using, you know, use, using those things. So, if if we if we wrap it up, what are your three bullet points, your three recommendations to start doing what exactly you suggested in 2007 in the British Medical Association handbook? So, what would be your three bullet points um, to a country to start? Um, implementing your recommendations. I'll, I'll go first. Okay. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. So I think um, building screening into uh, regular uh, primary care health settings is essential. I think um, ensuring funding for research and services is fundamental. And I think um, uh, having the regulators and the industry um, get behind that effort is probably the third building block that you need. Um, because what we run into time and time again is if, if the funding and the um, public health approach are not built into the legislative uh, intent from the very beginning, then the regulators really have very little uh, that they can do to sort of, um, you know, get uh, get leverage into the health system. So those those would be my building blocks. Excellent. Thank you, Professor Griffith. Just a word from you as well. Your three bullet points. Well, th there are so many different bullet points that you can come up with, and it's hard for me to say which is most important. Uh, I, mean, I want to echo what Let's Rachel just, just said. There is that funding is critical here and for me there should be a statutory levy i mean at the moment in the uk the gambling industry you know make voluntary donations towards treatment research and education you know in terms of the, the vast amount of money that they make there should be a statutory levy and that that would actually raise millions and millions of pounds you know that could actually fund not just um you know um within the national health service but it could also uh, fund dedicated centers as well there's got to be a realization um, from governments that gambling is a public health issue and therefore you know gambling has to be part of a department of health and not in some um, other types of department and it, you know when it comes to um, you know thinking about gambling as a health issue gambling you know problem gambling has to be embedded within the general teaching curricula alongside alcohol and drugs so thank you very much to both. Uh, it's been a pleasure to moderate this session and back to the chair. Thank you, organizers. Have a wonderful rest of the conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for an excellent presentation and a panel discussion. Our next panel discussion is on risk assessment and safer gambling tools and design. The the panel will be moderated by Christina Thakor of Ranking. A number of tools have been developed to assess the risk associated with specific gambling products. This session will highlight the key issues around detecting behavioral risk using behavioral tracking and what does the latest research indicate? How can we mitigate product risk in gambling? Ms. Ranking. Thank you very much, Chair.
Thank you. Um, just before we go into it, um, I have to say I, I listen into a lot of these kind of safer gambling and problem gambling conferences and events. And congratulations to the NBA. This is definitely one of the best ones I've um, been uh, having the privilege of listening to and contributing for a long time. Thank we you. are the final panel. Thank you. You're very welcome, and I mean that most genuinely. Thank you very much for the opportunity to actually moderate a panel, which I'm hoping will bring together all of the things that have been dis discussed during the uh, course of this conference today. We, we are all very familiar about some of the kind of standard tools, such as deposit limits, reality checks, self-exclusion, etc. As we start to take the discussion from supporting problem gamblers to minimizing harm, early detection, intervention, it is an absolute honor to be able to introduce and moderate a panel which has two of the world's best experts, in my opinion, in this particular area. Unfortunately, Dr. Richard Wood is unable to join us today. Good news is it gives us a little bit more time with Dr. Jonathan Park and Dr. Michael Auer, who are both specialists in their fields. We're going to start the session with Dr. Michael, talking us through some of the kind of things we're looking to explore in terms of behavioral analytics, we will then hand over to Dr. Richard, who's going to start to tell us about one of the newer kind of applications in minimizing harm, which is how can we put in protections around the actual design of the product itself. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Michael, who's going to give a little bit of information about himself and share some of the exciting work he's been looking at doing in terms of behavioral analysis. Dr. Michael. All right, thanks for the introduction. I hope you can hear me. Certainly can. Yeah, perfect, perfect. All right, so who, uh, the presentation, is somebody uh, pulling up the presentation too? Yeah, all right, okay, perfect. So I will try to um, talk about, you know, player tracking, AI, like, you know, tools, um, I like ways to analyze uh, the benefits of basically analyzing the data which naturally come along in online gambling. And I would trust, try to go beyond like early risk detection, detection of problematic gambling, but um, introduce a few other areas that you might be interested in, which are could be positively affected by player tracking. So. I'm from Necton, so uh, from that's an Austrian company. And as you already see, these days, so you, we talk about safer gambling. We talk about the benefits of player tracking, not only for responsible gambling, but other areas like inter money laundering and fraud, where you often see very similar patterns. And often, of course, players who might have trouble might be looking for other ways to sort of. Uh, and feed their gambling and then naturally we see you know fraudulent or uh, pet patterns or aml patterns so i've published some studies a few studies on in the area of player tracking uh, about um, limit setting self exclusions um, you know self report information personal personalized feedback so basically everything that could be uh, could be sort of analyzed optimized uh, could benefit from analytics, from data science, from AI. So here, for example, we try to find out, is it possible to predict limit settings? So let's say you could sort of anticipate, you could predict whether a player um, is likely, players are likely to change the limit. Then, of course, an operator could apply such algorithms, such predictions, to nudge players into a certain direction. So somebody might look like they are going to change the limit, but they wouldn't do it without being nudged in a certain direction. And that's what you can use AI or data science for too. 
because you have the data, the operator has the data, has the historic data, they know who changed limits, increased, decreased limit at, at, at certain points of time. And then they can use that data to train the algorithm to sort of learn a pattern of those players who are more likely to increase or decrease limits. So topics, and of course that list is not complete, that can be looked at from an analytical point of view are voluntary limit setting. So I would um, es estimate that most like real world studies with actual players from actual sites have been published around voluntary limit setting. Then we have mandatory play breaks where you you know block somebody for a certain period of time because they showed like excessive gambling personalized feedback when you you know inform players about the gambling either with the numbers or charts you show them how much they lost one or you really present text messages telling them okay we have observed that your for example depositing behavior has increased lately pop-up messages are a form of personal feedback the only difference is they appear sort of on the screen in real time prediction algorithms and then mandatory uh, play breaks that's basically very similar to point number two so here um, we published a study um, Dr. Griffiths, who was just on before me and myself um, in 2012. And what we did is, so we were interested whether players actually stop to gamble when they are presented with a pop-up message. And in that case, players who had been gambling for an hour, like casino games, um, and in that case, they couldn't, the operator couldn't measure the playing time, so they, they used a 1,000 consecutive games as a proxy measure for one hour of consecutive gambling. Because so in an hour, if you if you play the slots consecutively, you can play a thousand games, and then a pop up disappeared. And we found that very few players actually just um, in this case you see this here in the chart on the left hand side. It was uh, seventy five players, and I think seven point six four percent of players who saw this pop up message actually stopped to gamble. So the the impact was very low, right? So out of a thousand players, maybe six players stopped to gamble once they saw this pop-up message. Uh, we changed the pop-up message uh, in terms of the wording. We introduced normative feedback. We said, okay, um, very few players play as often as long as you do. And we managed to double basically the percentage of players who stopped after seeing this pop-up message. You see this here, the blue line compared to the red line, but still just one point. 39% of players stopped to gamble once they saw the pop-up message. So out of a thousand players, it was maybe 15 or 16 players who stopped to gamble. The rest continued to gamble, ignored the pop-up message. So now a lot of jurisdictions, they introduce mandatory personalized feedback. So they introduce requirements that sort of operators need to show players how much they won, lost, once they log in, or they have to put this, this uh, information into a certain section. And why this is actually necessary? It's necessary because we found when you ask players how much they lo lost and you compare it to the actual gambling, there is a large bias. So there is often players un underestimate the losses and they overestimate the winnings. So of course, how can they be aware of their own gambling? How can they sort of uh, prevent overspending when they lose control? And that's also, of course, uh, logical and understandable if you play slots or any other high event frequency game you easily can lose track of how often you spun how often you deposit it so that's i would say you know a basic requirement nowadays that an operator shows pr provides feedback to players in a very easy understandable way numerically as well as visually the next uh, study that uh, i want to talk about is mandatory play break so a lot of jurisdictions um, require operators to introduce play breaks. So let's say somebody has been gambling for 60 minutes, then it's not just a pop-up message, but it's really a play break. So they are shut off, they are blocked for, let's say, five minutes or 90 seconds. But so far, until uh, we published uh, that, um, um, so the, the, this other study down there, and there is one study which was accepted, which will be published uh, very soon, hopefully in a couple of weeks, and that's the study I'm talking about. We really try to figure out do play breaks actually help and how long does it have to be? So we tried 90 seconds, five minutes, and, um, and 15 minutes. And we tried to find out, okay, when do players basically come back immediately? So our sort of 
evaluation criteria, what, how long does it take for somebody after the play break to come back and gamble again? And we found that most players come back after a 90 second or five minute play break. So it seems they just wait until the play break is over and they start to gamble again. Only when the play break lasts for 15 minutes, players seem to really change activity, uh, go do something else and, and sort of not come back immediately after the play break is over. So that was a, uh, one learning for us and the Norwegian Lottery who sort of uh, did this study together with us, they then immediately introduced this 15 minute play break after a consecutive gambling session of 60 minutes. So here you see a concrete example and that sort of relies on actual data from actual operators. It's a real experimental study with a lot of analytics in it. And um, another study that uh, we're just working on and the data have been collected uh, was done with another operator. And what they actually did is, so they decided after a player deposits 10 times on a day, a 60 minute play break will be activated. So somebody who deposits 10 times since midnight, they can't deposit, they can't play for 60 minutes. And the question is here, do they actually simply come back after those 60 minutes, deposit again, or do they change activity? And what you see here is um, on the x-axis, you see basically the days that we collected data from, that's from July 23rd to September 15th this year. And you see here until August 20, there was no play break. So that's basically our control period. So here we see how what percent of players and deposit an 11th, a 12th, etc. time, and there is no play break. And then on the on August 20, the play break started, and we see immediately that the percentage of players who deposit once more after the 10th deposit, after the 60 minutes, drops significantly. So here we see again very specific effect if there is a 60 minute play break. Basically, the, the percent of players who continue to deposit. Um, drops from uh, 70 to about uh, 30 percent, and they also don't come back the very next uh, immediately after the play break. That's what you see here. I won't go into detail here, but what we've been looking at here was whether actually players um, um, sort of gamble more if they lost a lot before this play break or won a lot, because there were there of course um, some researchers um, assumed that players might sort of uh, chase after the losses. So let's say you gamble a lot, you deposit, you have lost a lot, they cut you off, then you just wait uh, to be able to gamble again to win back basically those losses from before. But neither in that study nor in the study before we saw any, any behavior similar to that. We didn't see players who lost a lot come back and gamble more after they have been shut down basically proactively um, by the system. So I will skip that one because I believe I have 10 minutes for this presentation. And in summary, I, cho I just wanted to sort of uh, shed some light on other areas apart from you know, early or harm or risk detection that can be assisted with analytics, uh, with uh, data science, and really embedded by operators into the site and really benefit players and help you know, uh, prevent overspending. Thank you. Dr. Michael, that is absolutely fascinating. Just before we move on to uh, Dr. Jonathan, may I ask you, just with the example with Playojo and the kind of intervention and the enforced breaks after a number mm -hmm. of deposit limits, do you believe, obviously, the statistics show that it is effective for that operator? But do you think that we need to have everybody across the industry applying the same standard for it to be tr truly effective? Knowing that, you know, one customer can have anything up to five plus online accounts. Yeah, sure. I mean, you're touching on, on a, a good point here. Um, um, the, you know, single customer view customers having multiple accounts. And of course, it's not just that, you know, I mean, different jurisdictions ask for different requirements so that the framework basically around the corner, you know, cornerstones are different across uh, jurisdictions. That's why we always try to apply, you know, or, or test, test our systems, our research in different areas, like for example, Norway compared to UK, compared to Germany, mm -hmm. where now you can only deposit a thousand euros a month, right? What's happening there. Now we, we, we monitor, um, 
uh, number of operators just sort of went live in the Netherlands and we see like very interesting patterns pat patterns hap happening here. But uh, I think one thing that we found, ex especially, especially from that research is if there is a play break, it really has to be longer than five minutes. I think that sort of applies, you know, in, in general. So I'm confident to, to make that statement. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Well, that's a lovely segue into the next session. You've talked very much upon what operators can do. We're now going to hear from Dr. Jonathan about the people who maybe are responsible for developing the product that is accessible to a number of operators. That note, Dr. Jonathan, may I please welcome you to the session? Thanks, Christina. Can you hear me okay? Certainly can, sir. Thank Brilliant. you. Brilliant. Okay. So, um, so good afternoon. Uh, my name's uh, Jonathan Park. I am director of Sofro, which is a consultancy that does research and education in the area of safer gambling. Um, specifically at the minute, though, we're looking at product risk about today. And just to link up what we, what, what, um, Michael's just been talking about. It's almost looking at the other side of the coin. So Michael was looking at assessing specific markers of behavioral harm to target interventions and interactions. And that's not always, but largely regardless of player behavior. In this situation, we're, we're targeting the specific product or features of a product to understand the source and the magnitude of the risk in order to potentially make some changes, and that's regardless of the behavior of the player. So they're both quite different. And so the brief but broad overview of some of the issues that relate to product risk assessment. Context, uh, let's consider some of the main risk. And I guess it's fairly obvious in saying it's to the extent to which a product is likely to increase the risk of gambling harm among its participants. But I think it's important to consider that it's not just the game, but also the platform and the feature. Um, I think of a lot of experts, and I know that this is it was included in the UK, focusing more on product is partly to do with what is generally perceived by some parties as irresponsible gambling. At least in terms of the published evidence that they don't... Gosh, apologies. We appear to have uh, lost Dr. Jonathan there. My Michael, are you, are you still on... Um... On standby to be able to perhaps just oh. fill in. And... <laughs> I, yeah, but I I, I can talk to no, Jonathan. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> you, you don't need to no, go but I, I to No, but I told I'm totally with Jonathan that for a very long time um, the focus has purely been on the player, right? On the sort of on you know the gambling patterns. What are you know indications of problematic play? Mm -hmm. But sort of the the product itself, I mean, the drug, if you want, right, has received very little attention, and there is very little sort of actual data-driven research into mm -hmm. the different aspects of um, of uh, of structural characteristics and impacts on problem gambling, right? Most of the research that has been published so far is based on expert opinions or maybe player panels. But we all know that the games are very complex, right? And nowadays, games in terms of the math might be very similar. So if you look at, let's say, a thousand slot games, then they are very similar in terms of, you know, event frequency, um, um, RTP, et cetera, et cetera. But it's totally other features, like is there a bonus game, you know? What can you collect in that game? Um, what 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 theme is it? Like Egyptian? Is it uh, about the Wild West? Um, is it about animals? Um, those those things are important. Then yeah, I mean, and that's of course game designers know that. I'm pretty sure because it's their product. But 
the research community still knows very little about the impact of the game on potentially problematic gambling. And, and Dr. Michael, hopefully we will have uh, Jonathan back with us very shortly. But in, in your view, when we talk about product, one of the um, products which is still the most popular in the world, and, and actually we're about to see an increase in the US and Canada with this, is sports betting. And a lot of the information that we know about male sports bettors is very much based upon what we know from the UK, Australia, Europe, which is typically an older yeah. generation. What's your view? And it may be too early to be able to say with any degree of conviction or authority, but do you think we need to kind of revisit what we know about uh, problematic play and sports betting for the digital generation? Sure, I mean, of course, there is a big difference between, you know, um, in-play betting and pre-match, pre-match, uh, pre-match gambling. Uh, maybe I don't know if Professor Griffith is still here. <laughs> he could also <laughs> join into the discussion if Jonathan doesn't doesn't make it back. And um, so, I one a very interesting example. So, uh, me and uh, Professor Griffith, we 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 published the research, and which we looked at, you know, the impacts of COVID on, uh, for example, sports betting with a Swedish sample mm -hmm. of players. And there, for example, of course, during the start of 2020, there were very limited events uh, in Sweden or worldwide. And what we, we didn't see basically sports bettors convert to casino gambling at all. So there was basically right. no conversion from sports bettors to casino gambling. Um, that's interesting, you know, because it sort of, at least, um, um, it looks like that they were, I mean, at least this sample of players was very specific group, which had little sort of, you know, connection over to, uh, to, um, to, to casino gambling. And now with, I mean, the Dutch market only started a couple of days ago, but with those operators who will work there, we also see an interesting pattern who are the ones who come in and play the on online casino very intensely compared to the ones they already have had before, mostly, of course, sport sports better. So that those, you know, introductions of a new registration, they are very good, you know, natural experiment um, experiment for us. So and in sports betting, of course, they also... Sorry, go on, no, sir. Go ahead. No, and no I was going thing, to say you raised which... <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say, you raise a very interesting point. Historically, it's been a connection between sports betting and slots. What we've seen over the last, I guess, 12 to 24 months is the rise of virtual sports, which is, I guess, slots for sports players. And we've also seen the emergence of esports. And certainly in some jurisdictions where physical sports or mainstream sports have been restricted by the pandemic, some of those sports bettors have moved towards esports. Yep. I mean, I can't uh, sort of uh, co co comment on that. What I can say is we also published research with horse bettors. Um, and um, and in that research, we were particularly interested in the reasons to gamble. So, reasons mm -hmm. to gamble. That's there are there are various. Uh, there is one basically st st standardized uh, scale with a couple of uh, you know questions. And the reasons to gamble are um, sort of there are four. I think four latent factors. That's like: Are you gambling mostly to win money? Are you gambling uh, to relax? Are you gambling to cope with, you know, stress as a coping strategy? And are you uh, the, are you gambling for social reasons, right? So th those th those four. And we had the opportunity with a um, sports betting operator online and land-based where everything is tracked to submit uh, this questionnaire to a large number of their players because we're mostly interested what are the main motivating factors for you know those players and we found winning money wasn't it so basically winning money wasn't 
the most uh, sort of uh, pop popular popular factor. And we also found that relaxation and coping as a sort of as a strategy were intermingled. So basically, the most problematic players were the were who who spent, of course, the most. Who also said they have problems with gambling were the ones who said they play on the one hand to relax, on the other hand also to cope with their problems. So that was basically the group of players who also scored high on PGSI questions and not the ones who said they play actually to make money or make a living or win money. And then, of course, it's also interesting when it comes mm -hmm. to, you know, addressing the players, uh, developing strategies, uh, you know, to communicate, to mitigate harm uh, among those group of horse, uh, horse batters. Gosh, Michael, can I ask you then, because based on what you just said, one of the chief motivators is is kind of escapism. It's it's moving away from reality and exactly. finding something yeah, exactly, that yeah. we can forget. Yeah. But so much of what we do as operators is based upon financial behaviors and triggers. But what you're yeah. saying is actually a winning player could be a problem gambler because it's not the money that is driving them. Yes. So that's it's interesting what you're mentioning is because I can tell you of another research <laughs> that we're currently doing. And yes, there please. we looked basically into metrics which just um, describe somebody's gambling. You know, how often do you deposit? How often do you deposit on average in a session? Do you play during the day or during the nighttime? Um, what's the average session length? So all metrics which are except for how much did you actually lose? How much did you deposit? Mm -hmm. How much did you wager? So just, you know, behavioral metrics. And on the other hand, we were looking into metrics like the actual loss, the actual deposit, the actual wager. And we tried to figure out, you know, predicting self, we tried to predict sort of future self-exclusion. And we found that you don't need to know how much somebody actually loses, so much, how much actual, somebody actually deposits, how long somebody actually gambles, but you only need to know the way they gamble, you know? Like, do they deposit wow. uh, in sessions multiple times? Uh, what kind of, you know, payment methods are they using? Do they gamble during the day and during the night? And I think that's important because it also means to some extent that you can apply findings, algorithms, research to different areas. Because, for example, now, let's say in Germany, we have those 1,000 euros deposit limit a month still you will have problematic gamblers right but if we would apply like um, you know a monetary uh, sort of uh, type of threshold algorithm then nobody is problematic there because they simply can't lose as much as elsewhere or if you look into Sweden where you have the weekly deposit limit of the 5,000 I think Swedish crowns and more and more countries jurisdictions are introducing those kinds of limits and you need to look you know, in order to sort of detect problematic play, you need to look at behavioral aspect. Um, I think he's Brilliant. back. Jonathan, Thank are you, you back? Thank you so much, Michael. I think we have Jonathan oh, back. So we're going to hand back to Jonathan. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Christina. So I, I guess I was talking to myself for the last 20 minutes. Um, so how, you how much were, time do you, you have? <laughs> Um, please, you please then, if, you, if you could maybe just go back to where we were, because what you have to say is so valuable. And where, where were we before I disappeared? Uh, go, go back to the, um, to the, the, the we second about... slide. Yeah. Second, can you go back a slide? No, before, before, before. Yeah, yeah okay, we only you know, started so to talk about. Okay, you started so to talk about start. the next right. slide. Uh, I, Christina, give me, give me give me a time frame to fit this into, and I'll get it done by then. Sure, is five minutes enough, sir? Are you still there, Jonathan? Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? You're dipping in and out, so let, let's see what we can do. If you just want to crack on with your presentation, let's see how far we get. Okay, I do. 
I do apologize. I got a special cable and everything set up, so I'm, I'm not sure what's going on. But let me <laughs> let me continue on. Um, what I was saying was this is a nice compliment to what Michael's talking. Uh, Jonathan, it may be helpful if you if you turn yes. your uh, webcam off, perhaps, so and we just go with audio. Thank you. Okay, good idea. Can you hear me okay? Certainly can. Brilliant. Okay. So I, I was just mentioning that this is a nice compliment to what Richard was talking what Michael was talking about. He's talking about assessing risk based on the behavior of the player. What we're interested in here and has had a lot less um, research policy consideration is assessing the product, the product features, product platform to consider what are the ways that you can target player protection strategies around that. So importantly then, and again, and I'll, I'll go through this uh, as quickly as I can, so this still makes sense though. Um, I think a lot of, a lot of o over the last two years, there's been more and more focus on product risk. And I think there's some discussion, um, and there's certainly view than the view that the shift towards looking at product risk is that traditional responsible gambling, player tracking, interaction and intervention aren't as effective as they should be. Um, and a lot of that's debatable. You have a range of different views from all different stakeholders in this. But I think from my perspective, there's definitely been a lot of uh, development over the last 10 years. But equally, when you look at the evidence, there's still a huge amount that needs to be done. And in terms of player tracks, interventions, and demonstrating that's effective. As a consequence, point number three there, having to assess and manage product risk is becoming more and more important. So for example, in the Netherlands and in other jurisdictions are considering this, to get a license you have to, and I think um, one of the speakers this morning was talking about this, to get a license and keep that license, you have to demonstrate that you know the, where the risks are coming from for the products in your portfolio, and not just that, be able to put together an action plan for how you're going to mitigate those risks. Um, and I'm going to talk about different types of mitigation shortly. Um, assessing and mitigation risk is very challenging, and there's lots of reasons for that, but there's probably the three most important. It's probably the least well understood area in gambling studies. Secondly, products in the gambling industry change and develop at a rapid pace, a high level of innovation. And when you look at academia, when you look at government, it's very and, and policymakers, it's very difficult to keep pace with that rapid change. You know, a piece of research could take two years. Next thing you know, that type of feature or that product might not even exist in its current form. So that's a challenge. I think the, probably one of the biggest challenges is that what makes a game fun and exciting is also the same thing that makes it risky or harmful or potentially addictive. So how do you tease that apart? Um, I won't go into uh, what various options exist out there in terms of protocols for assessing risk. But we recently published a paper, myself and Paul Del Fabro. Um, it's in the slide there. And some people can email me if they want to have a copy of it. But in a nutshell, um, we argue that not the, the, the risk factors that are being looked at, we don't think they're all relevant. Some relevant ones aren't included in these protocols. Some of these protocols are out of date. Um, and some of these protocols are very difficult to use and interpret. And who's interpreting them? Who's using them? Are they objective on both sides of the argument, either industry or those who are trying to demonstrate that these products are very addictive? So what level of objectivity do we have? So very quickly, this is a snapshot. This is a visual image of what research is telling us in the field. Um, and if I can describe it as quickly as I can, each dot is a ranking for the product in terms of risk based on studies. So we looked at, we reviewed the studies looking at product risk using survey data. And you, as you can see there, that slots come out on top in terms of the highest risk ranked towards number one, right down to lottery as being ranked as the least addictive or potentially harmful uh, towards eight, nine, and 10. Now, most of that research has looked at a combination of land-based and online uh, types of products. But also, they looked at self-report measures you know, from survey data. Um, and we wanted to look at A, all online products, and B, 
uh, looking at behavioral track data, actual, what, what are people actually doing? Um, and what I'm gonna go through now just in a couple of slides is our preliminary findings from just a couple of weeks of a collaboration that we're doing with Paul Del Fabro and Maris Catania at Kindred, who very kindly and bravely um, engage us and give us access to their data and to their product teams. So what, what are we looking at? Well, an odds ratio in this sense is if you look at racing, that has an odds ratio of 4.0. Um, and that essentially means that if you had gambled on a racing event at least once over the last six months, you're four times more likely to be flagged as being at risk using Kindred's behavioral algorithm for detection, what they call the PSEDS. So you can see that racing and slots are coming out on top. Um, uncommon types of sports and esports coming out higher than the general category of sports, right the way down to bingo. I think what was what it, what interested us is that we found that mini games and a mini game is a slot game that you can play at the same time as a bingo. And if you look at it, this type of slot is much less risky using these data and these criteria than the slots you can play while playing bingo. And typically, from a theoretical point of view, you would expect it to be, be the opposite, where you can play slot games and, and gamble simultaneously on two different games. You would expect that to be higher risk. The next slide is taking these same odds ratios, but laying, this looks quite convoluted, this image, but really what it's showing you is the bigger the circle is the greater the level of participation, the darker the circle, the higher the odds ratio. So it's looking at level of participation in relation to risk. So while racing is higher risk, it's also got a very low level of participation, so 0.2%. Um, and the products I've circled here, um, they are higher risk, but they're also much higher levels of participation. So when you go back to your licensing obligations, you have to think, and there's so much work to do here if this is the direction that from a regulatory point of view, we're going to go in. And so what you have to then do is prioritize your resources in terms of research, in terms of safer gambling strategy. So this idea of burden of risk is an important place to look. So it's not just about how risky is it, it's how is it affecting the player base? Um, so this final slide, again, just, just very quickly, uh, from the data that we had, we didn't have an extensive data in this first study, um, but looking at sub variations within the product ver vertical. So for example, when you look at the empirical academic research, um, you tend to find that pre-match betting on sports tends to be lower risk than in play betting. And indeed, as you can see at the bottom there, that's what we found. What was interesting here though, was that we didn't find it for racing. So pre-match race betting wasn't particularly more risky, again, using these data and these risk criteria that uh, compared to other forms of race betting. I think the takeaway from, from this slide is just to emphasize the fact, and it's often ignored, um, even from policymakers, is the importance not just to look at the broad category membership of a product, it's about the different sub variations within that product. Not all, in other words, not all sports bets are equal, not all slots are equal in terms of their potential risk. Um, and so that's important. Uh, th this is a three year collaboration with Kindred. And as I say, we're really just three weeks into it. So we're just scratching the surface. But needless to say, from my perspective, I think that there's still an awful lot that needs to be done to understand where the risks are coming from um, before you can start to mitigate them. But that being said, let me move on to the final slide. Um, if that was assessment, what do we do when we feel confident that we found or detected risk in a product or a feature or a platform? Um, and, I, and I'm aware of the fact that I will need to wrap it up. Um, let me just make some broad comments. So anybody who's interested in this and wants to get more detail, again, we've done a paper on this. Myself, Paul Del Fabro, Simo Dragicevic, Chris Percy, Richard Bayless, I can send a copy of it. But this slide is just showing a wide range of ways that you can try to target product-related risk. So let me give you five or five or six very broad uh, considerations to take away with you. I think the first thing is that product and platform restrictions tends to be where the main focus is at the minute, particularly from campaign groups, um, uh, politicians. I know here in the UK, we had a House of Lords committee report 
And one of the recommendations was that, was that products should be tested for risk with the most risky products being banned from entering the market. You have that all the way on one side, all the way through to what some people might say are softer or, or less restrictive forms of uh, product risk mitigation. So a few points here. One, there's been very little academic research showing how effective any of these are in mitigating risk in real life. Um, I think the second thing to say is that product and platform restrictions take a very long time to implement. And even when you've implemented them, it takes a very long time to change them if you've got them wrong. Um, without going into the merits or the, um, the limitations of the two pound stake on FOBTs here in the UK, whatever way you look at it, it took 10 years to get of campaigning to get it in. Um, and if we don't think it's working, I don't know how difficult it would be to change. So what's my point? My point is it's very important to get this right. Um, I think one of the problems is that sometimes industry are being charged with using that as an excuse for an action. And I think there's probably some truth to that. But it's still the reality of the situation. There's still so much that we don't know. And there's a lot of lot at stake in terms of resources, in terms of time, in terms of cost. Of, of making restrictions where we don't have enough evidence that they're actually going to work. Um, I think one of the other challenges that we have is if you restrict a feature or if you restrict a product, how likely is it that a player will migrate to a different operator or a different jurisdiction? Um, and as I said, if you're looking at product restrictions, are you going to affect the game to the point where nobody even wants to play it? And again, what are the implications for going and playing um, in a black market, for example? Final point I'd make is while I do think, it sounds like I'm not in favor of product restrictions. Um, on the contrary, I think where we have a good idea where there's risk, I think it, it could be a very, a very useful approach that you use in combination with other player safeguards in forms of interaction and intervention. Um, and we don't have time, and maybe we have time in the discussion section, but just one example is choice architecture. I mean, here you have a situation where the vast majority, or at least where I go and play and try them out, you have a big deposit button right on the front of the screen to deposit money. And you still have to move to three or four menus if you want to withdraw money. And there are numerous other kind of choice architecture examples where it, it feels like it's pushing the player in, in the direction of spending more money as opposed to being able to withdraw their money. Um, so I'll wrap, it, I'll wrap it up there, but there's lots of issues to consider there. Um, and if we have time, maybe we can discuss uh, at the end here. Well, I, I think regrettably, we are running out of time. And what you've just kind of presented to the audience I think, as you've kind of said, you're only three weeks into, into this collaboration. This is very much the start of the conversation. Um, as, as one of the observers pointed out, you, know, you compare racing with, with something like football. In, in some ways, they may all be fruit, but one is an apple, one is an orange. You know, horse race is typically shorter, a different kind of uh, customer demographic, different kind of customer interest level and mindset. So I think what would be really interesting is to maybe come back in three months' time and see how much more data you have and, and whether it's perhaps changed your initial kind of slides two, three, and four. Unfortunately, we, we have come to the end of this session and, and time is not our friend. Thank you so much, Jonathan, and to you, Michael. And thank you to the MBA for putting on what has been an absolutely fantastic conference. Thank you very much. Back to you, Lady Chairwoman. Thanks to you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you all three for such a great presentation and uh, great moderating. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to a brief statement from the president of the Hellenic Gaming Commission, Mr. Dimitrios Zanatos. Good afternoon, everyone. Ah, sorry. 
Good afternoon. Ακούγεστε, ναι, 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 ακούγεστε. Ακούγομαι, everyone from Athens. Thank you for inviting me to this conference and for giving me the opportunity to talk about our organization, the Hellenic Gaming Commission. I am new in the gaming market. I used to be a chartered accountant for decades. Hellenic Gaming Commission is the independent authority in Greece responsible for all of the gambling activities carried out in the Greek territory. The mission of our commission is to regulate, supervise and audit gaming in order to ensure legality and fairness in gaming activities, the interests of players, minors and the public, as well as the state revenue collection process. More details on responsible gambling and its implementation by the Hellenic Gaming Commission will be given by Mr. Kondoulas, a respected member of our authority. Thank you again, and I wish a great success to this conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Danatos. We will end today's conference with a presentation by Mr. Ioannis Kondoulas, board member of the Hellenic Gaming Commission, Implementation of Responsible Gaming in Greece. Mr. Kondoulas? Hi, uh, good evening from uh, Athens, uh, Greece. Uh, I would like to uh, congratulate the Cyprus National Betting Authority uh, for this contract, for this uh, conference, and uh, thank uh, the organizing committee for extending this uh, invitation to us to participate. Uh, we have observed extremely useful views, insight, and uh, information. And uh, we are uh, very pleased uh, to be here along with you. In my uh, presentation, uh, I will uh, give you an overview of our uh, commission. Uh, I will uh, also give you an overview of the legislation regarding responsible gambling and the survey in, uh, survey in Greece that took place uh, in the beginning of uh, 2020 uh, regarding uh, uh, the effects of gambling in Greece uh, before the pandemic. And finally, uh, I will provide you uh, with a future outlook uh, from our perspective. Uh, now, as also uh, our president told you, uh, our committee was uh, established in 2004 and we're an independent authority from February 2012, enjoying full administrative and financial independence from the government and the parliament. Uh, our mission is to regulate, supervise, audit all the gaming activities, also to protect the interests of players, minors and the public, also to collect gaming revenues for the state. Now, to that effect, we propose legislation and uh, regulations for the industry, issue and revoke licenses and certifications, uh, control all aspects of the uh, gaming chain, and uh, try to, to ensure that there is a strict adherence to transparency, fairness, responsible gaming, uh, gambling, financial conduct, and abidance to uh, the license uh, terms of uh, uh, the companies. Um, we also uh, establish and implement framework and policies to protect uh, minors and vulnerable, uh, vulnerable groups, as well as to combat illegal gaming, fraud, money laundering, and related uh, crimes. Finally, we impose uh, uh, sanctions and uh, fines. Now, uh, with respect to, resp to, reasonable, to responsible gambling, uh, the context uh, we see this uh, this in uh, Greece is uh, we see it as the regulations and provisions aiming at mitigating the negative effects of excessive exposure to gambling activities as well as their responsible and conscious decision making on the part of the player with emphasis on protecting minors and vulnerable social groups we see uh, responsible gambling as a collective effort uh, by players the society the industry and ourselves uh, to create uh, in order to create a safe and reliable uh, environment. Our priority areas uh, are to develop the regulatory framework, uh, carry out researches and studies that will help us 
uh, update the regulatory framework and see whether uh, and uh, be able to see uh, the new trends, developments, the new problems um, that transpire. Also, uh, it is a priority to us to have public awareness on the effect of uh, gambling activities. Uh, we believe in a close collaboration with local communities as well as relative clubs and associations for foreign and further uh, foreign national authorities. Finally, we design tools and applications to inform and raise public awareness. At this point, we have uh, the eASOS platform on our website, which is a, 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 an anonymous uh, self, uh, self-evaluation, whether uh, somebody can, uh, is probably, whether somebody should uh, seek uh, professional uh, uh, help or should uh, consider um, get, getting more information about a uh, possible uh, addiction or inclement to uh, uh, gambling. Uh, finally, two th- in 2015, we issued a resolution uh, with respect to resp- or, uh, reasonable uh, gambling principles. Uh, it, is, uh, it aims to ensure that all gaming activities are carried out in a socially responsible manner in order to mitigate negative effects. Uh, it governs the, the resolution, the resolution governs all gaming activities and it applies across the board to all, uh, to, to, to all entities that uh, have to do something with the whole uh, gaming activity. Licensees, operators, even the internet service providers, advertisers, and uh, gaming uh, stakeholders. Now, to give you a small, a, a brief overview of the uh, resolution, uh, the principles, uh, the principles it uh, uh, produces is uh, set uh, constraints on commercial communication, such as forbidding any communication, ad- inducing active participation in gambling activities, or creating the misconception of, uh, of uh, substantial and easily accumulated wealth through gambling. Uh, the regulation provides for specific uh, uh, provisions to protect minors. For example, commercial communication uh, cannot refer to uh, minors, cannot uh, identify minors as a, a group targeted. Uh, it's uh, forbidden from uh, using uh, jargon or young figures uh, jargons that are uh, common to minors or figures and characters that do not have the legal uh, uh, age for being able to participate in gaming activities. Uh, Also, there is uh, no broadcastings are permitted uh, before or after shows uh, for minors. also, by this regulation, um, it is necessary to, to have pre-approval of all commercial communications. And uh, also, we regulate sponsorships, uh, corporate social responsibility, and loyalty uh, programs. There are certain restrictions in how, on uh, the way, there are sponsorships and uh, such uh, programs. Uh, and finally, the regulation provides for sanction and fines ranging from 1,000 to 300,000 uh, euros. Now, I would like also to say uh, a, a few words about online gaming. Since uh, Greece, uh, uh, since we just uh, finally uh, licensed the, the, the first uh, uh, online gaming uh, uh, companies and uh, provided license to conduct online sports betting and license to conduct other online uh, gaming because until this point uh, the oversight and the license was from other uh, European Union countries and uh, uh, the companies uh, could uh, offer services in Greece online and being regulated by other uh, authorities. Now, in uh, regulating the online uh, gaming and the licenses uh, issued uh, uh, from uh, our commission, uh, the legislation provides that uh, um, the licensees have to ensure that the 
that uh, the players have the ability to stipulate certain limits, monetary limits uh, with respect to deposit, uh, with respect to loss, to a loss limit, and also a time uh, limit uh, regarding uh, the time spent on uh, online games and uh, on betting on uh, Regarding online gaming provides also for uh, exclusion and has a legal age uh, at uh, 21, set at 21 years old. Also, there is a two euro uh, uh, betting limits on slots and prizes. Um, on slots and prizes. Uh, finally, we have uh, it's provided that we have uh, market surveillance for identifying unlicensed uh, online government services and updating. Uh, blacklist. Um, as I said earlier, uh, our commission uh, asked for a survey which uh, uh, took place between uh, 11 and April uh, 24th, 2020 uh, on the effects of uh, gambling uh, in, in Greece. It, was, it had a sample of 3,000 uh, individuals and, it was, uh, uh, and the data was collected uh, through 80% uh, through standalone telephone survey and 20% online using uh, questionnaires. Now, um, the research uh, showed us that um, it is a predominantly a gambling is... A, we have a male uh, males uh, uh, getting involved in uh, participating uh, in the certain industry and also we see that uh, the, the 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 age the, the age bracket from 18 to 34 years old as well as 35 to 54 is the ages that are um, predominantly uh, involved in uh, gaming in uh, Greece, there are also there are uh, some uh, very encouraging uh, data we found from that survey. Uh, uh, Sixty percent of the players uh, spend uh, less than ten year ten euros uh, each month. So, uh, to this effect, uh, we see that uh, there is. They, 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 we could draw a conclusion that it's more than a, it's more um, an entertainment factor uh, with respect to the reasons for uh, consumer spending. Uh, also, it is very encouraging that the frequency of betting in a week is less than one hour for at least 78% uh, of years. Now, because the survey was conducted prior to the pandemic, we see that, that there is a very uh, um, a, 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 there is a mass a, a vast preference in in-person gambling rather than a, a online. But I think this has changed dramatically, I suppose, due to the pandemic, and this is uh, one aspect we need to revisit. Uh, I think uh, after uh, we get over the pandemic and we start to um, uh, go on uh, and people start to go on with their lives as they used to prior to the pandemic. Now, uh, with respect to uh, the problem gambling severity index, uh, we see that um, with respect to problem to gambler problem uh, it is it is a major factor regarding uh, uh, winning money i mean that's the the, the 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 answer that was most common on the other fact on the other side it is encouraging the fact that the entertainment aspect i gamble for fun is also shows that this has an increasing uh, effect which is, I think, uh, from our perspective, it is encouraging because uh, we do want to uh, put out the message that gambling is a, a means of entertainment. 
and uh, it, it's not associated with making uh, money. Uh, finally, uh, we are uh, looking forward uh, as a commission uh, and uh, being, as I said, uh, extremely having uh, having observed uh, the extremely useful information from uh, your conference. Uh, we believe that uh, what our commission has to do, at least for Greece, is to um, um, uh, do more uh, surveys on gaming trends after the pandemic to see whether there has been a change uh, in, in all. Uh, we are trying to focus on enhancing preemptive and affirmative actions on uh, responsible gambling. And I think to this effect, uh, AI technology will be very uh, uh, useful. And finally, data analysis uh, from the control and surveillance data system that uh, we, are, uh, we are ready to implement uh, will be very useful in uh, uh, analyzing uh, data and seeing uh, how could we could uh, how we could from uh, uh, responsible gambling uh, mitigate the effects of gambling on uh, the society. Uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and also thank you for the honor to participate in your conference. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for joining us today uh, for the fourth Safer Gambling Conference, which basically also marks uh, the Safer Gambling Week, which is this week and it begins today on the 4th uh, of October. Um, congratulations to the National Betting Authority for organizing this event. Thank you. Have a good afternoon and keep to safe gambling.